Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone and welcome in such a lovely afternoon, a little bit overcast today. We are here at the World Environment Day. We are going to share about ecosystem, about plant life and animal life with the symbiotic relationship of all these different um, plant life and uh, animal life. We are right here at Zoe's Road. We have one of the most interesting plants that we need to share for our afternoon. Between myself, Rexin, and um, Khalid behind the camera, we have uh, we wish you for a lovely afternoon drive. And please don't forget to send question on head check while they're from Twitter. If you're under age of 18 years, please pop us an email on kidsquestion at worldf.tv. And uh, don't forget to send more questions directed on the World, <coughs> World F website. Head over to channel page and submit your question there. Let us take a look. Today here, we have a lovely, lovely plant called orchid tree. This is one of the plants that really, when we talk about the symbiotic relationship of all different species as plant mature, a plant in the area or plant life in the area, this is one of the examples that we have in the area. It's hosted on the Knopfon. The Knopfon tree is dead at the moment. You can really get um, more details while the camera is zooming. Very interesting. You may ask your question, what is the relationship between leopard orchid and a tree? It's such an amazing, amazing information that uh, I have today that I want to really share all together in the World Environment Day. The leopard orchid, remember, is one of the Avitus tree that uh, really... Um, Take or leave in other part of in other trees, of course, as a benefit of uh, nutrients on a tree. It really doesn't get um, the tree itself. It doesn't really disturb the crown thorn because the crown thorn tree itself in this scenario is no longer living. But this plant material, of course, if you look at down there, you can see quite a lot of. Uh, thin sort of uh, roots that going down. Wherever it takes place and germinated, it will decay that area in order to get nutrition. It gets water from the tree, of course, and a nitrogen, and the minerals from the host of the tree, because once it's decay, it gets wet. All the minerals is going to collect it on the decay part of the tree, which it really create a living for the leopard orchid tree. And of course, let us look at uh, weather in a different location that we have. Yes, uh, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to this World Environmental Day here at Juma Private Game Reserve in uh, the Sabi Sands, South Africa. Well, good afternoon everybody. My name is Cedric Dold and behind the camera here on Rusty today, we've got Panda. So yes, welcome to uh, the show in the Sunset Drive. It's all about symbiotic relationships today. So it's all about different species assisting other species and just the relationship in this entire environment that we do have. But one of my favorite um, I can say relationships that we do have around here is the Nile Monitor. Of course, I'm at Twin Dams on the side here, and we've always seen this Nile Monitor around here. Now, of course, a Nile Monitor will use a termite mound. As you can see, here is an active termite mound right to the side of me here. And as this termite mound is active, what the Nile Monitor will do just before winter, it'll actually come to one of these active mounds, 
and it will actually dig a hole, a nice dig hole, a deep hole, maybe about 20, 30 centimeters deep. And while she digs there, then she'll lay around about 40 to 60 eggs inside that mound. Now, of course, because that hole has been dug already, she'll leave and she will not incubate those eggs. And what happens? The termites will come and actually start packing mud around the eggs to actually close up that hole to incubate her eggs. And it takes about 10 months for the incubation of the eggs. So sometimes I look around the mound and I'm finding, looking exactly where and how they actually dug up in this area. And I actually came across a beautiful section here. It looks like a, a mile monitor actually came here and dug and actually laid her eggs inside here. So sometimes if I just take it away a little bit, oh my word, look, I've got an OD, an OD egg. Oh my goodness. Dig a little bit deeper. <gasps> and I've got Tessa egg. A Tessa and an OD egg. Wait, there's a third one. Let's take a look. You dig in the mound. And we've got the Gert egg. So we've got three eggs. We've got OD, Tess, and Gert egg. So it looks like this now monitor decided to lay some Juma crew. But anyway, this is chicken eggs. It's, uh, it's quite an egg example of what a Nile monitor will do. So this is, we call it a commensalism relationship. So commensalism relationship means that the Nile monitor is actually gaining and actually getting something from the termite mound, but the termites is not harmed at all or they're not around. So it's just a one-way relationship where of course a Nile monitor will get its eggs incubated. Anyway, <laughs> as you know, this is all about symbiotic relationships today. So it is going to be a fantastic day today. I think it's going to be fantastic to explain about our environment. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens, each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. Here we go. We've got uh, all three little eggs that we just uncovered from uh, that termite round, the three of them. Odie, Tess, and Gert. Welcome aboard, you three. Welcome aboard. So. <laughs> Magic dragon wizard. I will definitely be egg extra careful with these guides and cam ops. I'll just put them away so that they can get in to a nice soft little place. What a lovely way to start. But I'm so excited for this afternoon. As you know, it is World Environmental Day. It's the life cycle of all these things around here. It is so needed. And I think uh, the less us humans have interference in these beautiful untouched areas, the better um, nature survives and nature always finds some way to survive with one another. So it's nice to see how they use each other and uh, how they actually kind of uh, flourish with each other. Anyway, while we continue with other searches around here, let's head to Pridelands. And so are we. We're currently staring at a Vicelia exuvialis, or a flaky thorn, or whichever common name you'd like to call it. And I am searching for ants this afternoon, if they haven't blown away in the wind. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and I'm here at Eco Training Pridelands, which is part of Baluli Game Reserve and the Greater Kruger Park. And I'm sure you're all surprised to see me. 
hopefully. Yeah. No, I'm joking. Please don't clap and applaud. It's really, it makes me uncomfortable. Okay, but I haven't got anything over there. So I'm going to drive a little bit further forward to the next flaky thorn. Not flaky thorn. The thorns aren't flaky. The bark's flaky. Flaky bark thorn. And I'm going to drive BK <laughs> into the tree so that he can really get a close look. And seeing as though it is World Environment Day, I think it is important, as everyone else has been doing, to focus on the little ecosystems. So like I said, I'm actually looking for cocktail ants, um, but we will talk about them more when I do find a tree that has this arthropod on it. However, what I have found, Vicky, I don't know if you can see them. I'm gonna try and move it around a little bit without being too, I don't know, sorry. BK is now using the car as a, a, a jungle gym. Do you see that little spider web there? Over here. Just tiny in between the thorns. Yeah, there we go. Everybody, please mind BK. If you could only see the position that he was in to get the shot. Okay, there it is. Hello, Jade, who's just 11 years old, who's from Cape Town, and you're watching. Jade, have you, you've probably seen lots of spider webs in your, in your life. I don't know if you were like me, but when I was 11, I used to go searching for all sorts of weird, wonderful things. So that is a tiny little spider web made from a spider called a tropical tent web spider. And I think anything that utilizes any of the acacia trees, let's just call them that. But of course, we all know that the names have changed. But because it's a common name, we can, of course, use it. I think it's a clever idea because this tree produces so much sap, it might attract lots of insects. Also, they can get stuck in that spider web. Now, I can't see the spider on there. I suspect that it's probably hiding away somewhere, but that can't be very big at all. I don't even know, PK, if I would be able to spot it. But this tree is in, entirely covered in these little spider webs. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet, and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. As our global Wild Earth family grows, we know that many of you struggle to get your questions answered during the live safari. Going forward, we will be holding AMAs for our Wild Earth explorers on a regular basis. The first is with our resident leopard whisperer, Tristan Dix. Join me for an AMA on the 8th of June, straight after the Sunset Safari. This will be your chance to ask me anything you like. All you have to do is sign up to be an explorer, and you can meet me here on Juma with your questions ready. When they go hold of speaking for the ad pod, then it's done, eh? Yeah. Oh! <laughs> Apparently not. Apparently not. Apparently we're still live. My bad. I read that description wrong, but please forgive me. I'm new at this. We're going to jump back in the car, and I'm actually going to try my luck elsewhere. This area seems to be a little bit quiet. Off you go to Cedric, who's maybe still got his head in the sand, or perhaps he's looking for something else. Yes, I've just uh, moved my way from uh, away from that uh, termite mound where we found uh, the three funny eggs, and uh, I'm here at a quarry bush. Another symbiotic relationship uh, that takes place around here is, of course, the berries of a uh, magic quarry. If you look carefully at the magic quarry, I'll just move close slowly here. You'll see you get very ripe uh, berries and you get the green berries. So very much, it's very important with that coloration for birds, especially birds like your barbets, your lurries, and oh, there's so many different bird species that'll eat the berries and the seeds. So where the symbiotic relationship, uh, relationship comes in, is actually a mutualism uh, relationship where both species, uh, the, fl uh, the plant and the bird, uh, they do gain uh, from their relationship. So what happens? The quarry bush like, hey, look, I'm very attractive, beautiful little ripe berries, nice and orange, nice and red, eat me. 
And that's what it says here. Not the green ones, because the green ones doesn't say eat me, but the red ones will say eat me. So of course the little bird will take this bird and then, mm, eat the berry. Sometimes swallow the whole thing. Oh, I like this, but uh, <laughs> and fly off with the with the seed, and of course digesting the entire berry with the seed, and it will perch itself somewhere, maybe on a termite mound, or next to a termite mound, or anywhere, and of course it'll do its droppings, and the seed will come out, boom, and it'll get put inside the ground, and it will germinate from there. So of course, the quarry is uh, uh, pretty much uh, gaining from the bird, and the bird is gaining food from the quarry bush. So that is, the magic quarry is such an important part to play around here. That's why you see a lot of magic quarry bushes around on the Turbot Mounds, exactly the one that I was at now, because of like your, even your hornbills, the hornbill will actually put, pop the whole berry into its mouth, and um, of course that seed will not digest properly, and when they sit on those Turbot Mounds, of course that seed gets pushed into the holes, into a very high uh, a mineral uh, soil, and of course those quarries will grow nice and lush around those termite mounds. So yes, <laughs> it is very bitter, but it's not too bad. Uh, Cindy, no, not everything is edible in the bush. You gotta, you gotta know what you're gonna uh, eat. Um, and that's a big thing. Um, if you do come in into the bush like this and it's your first time here, um, don't go and grab anything that uh, looks orange and ripe and edible because there's a lot of things here that's got uh, toxins, poisons in it. Uh, rather speak to somebody that knows plants and trees and berries around the area um, to rather gain um, understanding with it. It's the same as mushrooms. I know Byron over there at Betty's Bay, he's, he's very, very uh, clued up with his uh, fungus, so he knows exactly which mushroom you can pick there to actually eat and which ones you can't because you know mushrooms can become very very poisonous to a person and uh, so not a good thing so rather speak to somebody and uh, hopefully that person will assist you on what you can eat and what you can't luckily I know about the gory bush that you can eat this to celebrate World Oceans Day and create awareness for the role that the oceans play in everyday life Wild Earth has some brand new dive blind merchandise in our shop. T-shirts, sweatshirts, bags and even caps. So take the plunge, head over to our shop and see what you can find. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. We only have one Earth. This phrase highlights the challenges of collective action between nations. It emphasizes the great test of our time. Achieving environmental change cannot be met by countries acting alone. Head over to the Wild Earth Shop to buy your only One Earth merchandise and create awareness for global change this World Environment Day. a nice uh, magic uh, quarry experience to understand uh, the relationship between birds and quarries. Uh, we're going to continue. So let's head over to Rexon to see what he's got to show you. Welcome back uh, uh, today here in the symbiotic creationship of all species out in nature. We're still here with the leopard ukut. I would love to share with you with the specific plant that we are witnessing at the moment in front of us. It tend to be very complex to understand how actually the leopard ukut uh, get to benefit from the tree. Most of scientists, they know uh, what I'm going to say it here. And if you Google some of it, you can to find it from the Google. If you look at directly this plant here, it's really situated in a perfect area. Look, uh, the bark of the tree is being a little bit uh, shaded and the roots get in between. When it rains, of course, this species doesn't benefit from the water directly. It benefits from the fungi that uh, really 
gets in between the bark and the roots of the tree is uh, what is called mycorrhizal fungi that uh, really if it gets wet the fungi itself it will almost is going to develop from the roots itself when the water gets into the roots the fungi suck the water the leopard ukut gets the juice from the fungi is the nutrition that they get and make this uh, specific tree to be more healthy without all this uh, bark that uh, around the tree and the clay of the roots or the bark itself is not going to happen so this fungi that grows there in order to for tree to survive and more healthy is such amazing this kind of a uh, uh, symbiotic relationship it called commercialism one part benefit and the other part is not affected you can tell now here this knob thorn is not affected at all what it's really uh, getting here, it become host, and one day, of course, you will get to see this leopard ichid. It will growing even. Are you a fan of the Juma clan? If the answer to this is yes, then you are cordially invited to our Hyena Halabaloo starting on the 13th of June. During this week, we want to take a trip down memory lane. Please send in your favorite Juma clan moments to hahina at wildearth.tv by the 7th of June and we will dig into our archives and try our hardest to play it out during this week of hahina celebrations. Find a way into, into the kill to eat, get their fill in there as well. But they're also going to be told off. See, it's, lions are not great at sharing their food. <laughs> Okay, guys. Let me just take in frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. Dirk, lovely, I uh, love your comment. Today it's a very special day. I would like to really, after this, we'll talk about the the ecosystem and environment where we are in the area. It's a lot of complex that we can really share. We were talking about the leopard ukit. If you look at around in the area, we have trees, but we'll get a very perfect example how the symbiotic relationship between plant and animal is such very interesting. We will also um, like to uh, emphasize with uh, with animal and trees and grass later on, which it will be the best uh, after this. While I was uh, a kid, of course, with this symbiotic relationship, I didn't understand well. I was used to, to I was told that uh, the tree itself benefit from the 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 other uh, uh, from the other tree but uh, as i grew up and uh, really researched quite a lot it tells exactly the symbiotic relationship the one part doesn't benefit uh, the other tree doesn't benefit from the uh, the host itself and let us take this opportunity from the leopard orchid and uh, link to taylor in thailand Thailand, i mean Well, we're staring down into deep, dark, dangerous holes right now. And because I can't find any insects that are, that are alive, I thought I would show you the remnants of insects. And I found these in a cavity of a tree, which we'll get to in a minute. So this is quite cool. There's so many different things in here, definitely all belonging to arthropods. There's millipede, exoskeleton, there's bits and pieces of different types of beetles. There's a wing of some sort, maybe belonging to an antlion. And what I'm about to do now, I do not recommend that you try at home because this is probably one of the stupidest things that I'm going to do. And I tell people, don't stick your hand down in. Thing living here currently but something's clearly having a feast so oh no i'm gonna get, end up getting my hand stuck in here 
which is going to be very entertaining. Okay, we've got one. What else is really cool? There's something in here that I have absolutely no idea what it is, which I'm quite keen to pull out because I don't know what it belongs to. Two. We'll just pull out. We'll pull out four things. Sorry, be careful. My head's in your way. Yeah. yeah. Come here. I needed tweezers. I should have brought tweezers along today. The forceps probably would have been a, a better option. Okay, three, one more. We'll go with an easy one. Ta-da! Please, whatever's living in here, don't come and get me. Okay, 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 that's enough before I tempt fate. Right, if you look into my hand, I have got a couple of things. And I've also got a, sorry, that's a very rude wing. No wonder you got eaten. You behave like that. Okay, I have to hold it in between my fingers. Okay, so this wing, um, there is another piece to it. I really think it belongs to a, uh, an adult ant lion of some kind. They normally have these big floppy wings and the ant lion species out here have normally got these blotches on them. Then, of course, there's a white ring, which is fairly easy to identify. Hey, get back there. And that's from a millipede, just one little uh exoskeleton there's a whole bunch of them that's a stick we don't need that and then this one's quite cool this is part of a beetle of some kind and i'm not really sure which beetle at first i thought maybe like a dung beetle but i i, I retract that statement the only reason why i thought it would be a dung beetle is you can see how sort of they've got these little grooves on the edge of their legs which dung beetles are typically used to push up in a ball <laughs> Izzy, you thought that I'd found a crazy baboon spider. I would not be touching one. I, w I typically don't pick up things that are alive, but if it has died, best you believe they'll be digging into it. Anyways, this thing, what on earth does this belong to? That is terrifying. I don't, I don't even, I don't understand. There's barbs on it. There's this red, uh, what is that? Does something shoot out of there? Probably not, but it really looks quite scary. Um, and very sharp. I have no idea. So I'm definitely going to be looking for screenshots later so that I can rummage through my insect book. Actually, I should have it in the car with me. If we find some elephants, I'll have a look and try and figure out what that belongs to. But if you have any suggestions, you know, you're more than welcome to send them in, of course. Hashtag Wild Earth. You know the drill by now. So that's quite cool. But there's a lot of other interesting things that are here. I'm actually not sure who has eaten this. It could be a scorpion. I don't think that it's going to be a baboon spider. Or maybe. However, probably something like a lizard as well or a skink which will utilize these crevices and i'm going to just put them back in to the hole where it belongs bye bye we're recycling oh no no i don't know who's going to use that maybe when someone wants to go to a fancy dress party anyways this tree that we're looking at over here and this knob thorn that's next to it unfortunately i say unfortunately they were pushed over by elephants and these elephants push over trees for many different reasons. We'll get into that discussion at some point. But when they do this, they actually create microhabitats, which is not always a bad thing. So it creates a space for lots of other creatures to kind of live here. The cavity just like this for something like a squirrel to take refuge in, or as we suggested, a snake, spider, scorpion, who knows. Anyways, back across to Juma you go to see what Cedric has now found. Yes, uh, I'm just uh, yeah back into in the bush again, just uh, looking and uh, just understanding a few things, and especially that we've got a windy day. It's quite uh, breezy today. It's very nice to pick up uh, on uh, this species. This is known as a wild uh, cotton, as you can see. It very much has the cotton look to it. Now, talking about a symbiotic relationship, now I wonder if this bush has got pretty much, it's gaining something from the wind. And of course it is, but the wind is not gaining anything from the, the wild cotton. So this is pretty much known as a commensalism relationship. So what happens is once these little pods burst, these little fluffy pods come out and there's some, oh, there's a spider. Sorry, I am, <laughs> me, and, me and spiders. <laughs> anyway, sorry, there was a spider that went into my head. <laughs> this morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala, and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree, and then the hyenas came to steal it. But uh, 
What an incredible sighting. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwa's Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. All right, we're gonna move on. And let's see what else we can find. That's got uh, some relationship for some reason around here. But there is so many reasons here, yeah, so it's always nice just to start scanning the area. I'll just take a look. Oh, wait, we need to go to, apparently I had uh, uh, information about some uh, lions. So hopefully we can get to those lions. They're not, they're not too far from here. And apparently they were on a, a Juma this morning. So I'm gonna be turning around and I'm gonna head into that area. And let's see, maybe there is a relationship going down there. But it is a lovely day uh, at the Juma Private Game Reserve. It is uh, very sunny and I love my shirt. I'm glad I've got a white shirt on. It feels very nice and cool, especially on a little bit of a sunny day. So it's an ideal little shirt. <laughs> Karania, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, is the spiders dangerous? No, not all spiders. We do have certain venomous spiders around here yeah, that you've got to watch out for. Um, you don't just go pick up any spiders, but the spiders are very good for you. Honest, I don't kill spiders at all because I find they are fantastic for the houses, like catching mosquitoes and all that. So spiders is not dangerous, but uh, you can't just go picking up any spider. You've got to really be careful. So, Karania, so I will definitely, uh, you know, just uh, rather, like with me, um, I've been scared since I was a kid. Um, I didn't like to, I always like, uh, I don't know, as a kid, but I got used to it. And now I don't mind it, but if a spider jumps on me like the one that jumped on me just now, yes, I will I will jump just as high as the spider. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, they're not, but they're not dangerous. No, that one that jumped on me wasn't dangerous. I just got a fright. I was, uh, I was just a scaredy cat there. So, yeah. Thank you, Karanias, for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully you're enjoying the sunset drive. And while we continue, let's head over to Taylor while she's still on her bushwalk. I don't blame you, Cedric. My my dad, who is six foot two, barrel chested as they used to describe him in the cricketing days, and he screams like a three year old toddler when he sees a spider. I thankfully have not inherited those fears. Not my favourite. Anyways, we're not looking at a spider. We're back at the flaky bark acacia, the Vicelia exuvialis, with all the thorns. Now we found something that has created a cocoon out of the thorns, which really surprises me. Now, some of you have most likely seen uh, what we call a bagworm, where they, the larval stage essentially will create a cocoon out of anything that it can find. There are some species that are quite particular about the material that you use. This one I'm not 100% certain of, as it's decided it will only make its cocoon out of the thorns of this flaky bark acacia, which I don't, how do they do that? They don't have arms. They're not particularly powerful and strong like dung beetles and termites, and not termites, I meant to say ants, and ants, same, same, but different. They're completely different. Um, so that's really, really interesting, and it's now got itself sort of hung up there. BK's actually got the best view. I'm trying to look in between all the thorns at the moment. Now, we often, we don't normally see them up in a tree like this, unless you're a bit strange and you like to stick your head into bushes looking for creepy crawlies like I do. You normally find them trying to make a dash across the road, although it's not fast. And it basically looks like a little worm or a caterpillar. And then they crawl around and then they pupate in them. And I think it's the females that actually never leave the cocoon. They just live there for their whole life. And if you lived in a very cold place, why would you want to get out of your duvet? It doesn't make sense. Anyways, haven't a clue how it created that. That is unbelievable. Did it just find 
dead. The birds have been on a journey for like the last few weeks looking for broken off acacia thorns. I don't know if anybody's got any insight. Otherwise, I'm going to resort to searching the interweb as to how strong are bagworms because maybe maybe there's a study being done on them that we haven't got a clue about. Anyways, BK actually found something else. He gets all the credit for this one. He And he gets the credit for the bagworm. He was like, oh, let's go check on the caterpillar. Now, just bear with us for a moment or two while we try and, and focus on it. And I'm going to try and sneak in from the side without disturbing anything because you're probably going to be like there's nothing there Taylor you're talking nonsense I can't even see it okay I can see it and the wind is blowing I don't want to poke it stay stay tree that that is a thing that is an alive thing now I've only ever seen these a couple of times and I've completely forgotten what they're called so I shall therefore call them a thorn bug but I think that they're quite closely related to scale insects and that they uh, penetrate the inner bark of, of plants and basically feed on the liquid parts. So like the xylem, for an example, and the phloem that are just below there. So they'll eat the sugary, sugary sweetness. But I stand to be corrected, but I will have a look. I have never seen one, oh goodness, I've never seen one this big before. Like that's really dramatic. And obviously it's got the most amazing camouflage to blend into the tree so that it is not obviously seen by any predators because quite often things like scale insects um, are quite vulnerable because they're very slow moving and they gather around on these trees which is quite cool but we're still looking for um, another type of symbiotic relationship that we're going to find uh, hopefully at some point with the ants and and on this tree too if you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Oh, it's not as graceful as <laughs> he's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's going to do it, but let's see. Hmm, let me go around the other side. Ooh, Alicia, you've asked a great question for a nine-year-old. You've asked, which creepy crawlies am I most afraid of? Absolutely nothing, Alicia. I'm not scared of anything. No, I'm joking. I'm terrified of solifuges. Whew, that's not nice. My best friend and I, we have um, had a few horrific encounters with solifuges. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be able to find one or show you one, Alicia. Um, but they, sometimes people call them sun spiders. Oh, wait, I can show you. No, I can't show you because they're not going to be in this book because they're in fact arachnids, not an arthropod. Sorry, I thought I was going to show you a picture and I've just got a, a book dedicated to insects in my hand. But I'm still creeping around. You'll probably see me walking in between the thorns. I'll be very sort of cut up in the moment looking for anything. Lots of spider webs, no spiders. But perhaps they've already done their thing and are hiding away because it is getting really cold at the moment and they don't particularly like that. Okay, well, I found a lot of gum that is being produced by the acacias. So hopefully we'll come back and, and show you that at some point and maybe something will be eating it. Off you go to Rexon. Welcome back from Taylor. We are right here, still a little bit south of the, uh, north of the uh, Hyena Den. We are left to really share a beautiful information about the symbiotic relationship that takes place in animal life and plant life. We will look at this beautiful tree here, which it does have a green uh, sort of leaves, and the other side is uh, dry. Why certainly it's like this? It's very complex to understand. The same tree, the other part is dead and the other 
section is green. This is, it's all about the symbiotic relationship. A tree itself have a chemical, a chemical that always need happy, happy vol, or, I mean, browser species to come into the area, nimble on the leaves, then they can limit all the chemicals. If the animal like an uh, elephant and, um, uh, I mean, giraffe, kudu, it doesn't come into the area to eat this particular tree, there will be no tree left in the area because the chemical itself is going to overflow from the tree itself and that particular tree is going to be in danger. This is, happens quite a lot and the symbiotic relationship is mutualism. The two species benefit at the same time. The tree benefits from the um, elephant or giraffe by eating the leaves in order to reduce the chemicals that it's in the tree itself. The part of the leaves, it will nimble, that will send the thermons and the release the thermons. By so doing, it releasing the tannin and that is the chemical that might kill the tree. Let's take for example, if a tree doesn't have rain in the area and it doesn't rain for five years in that particular tree, it doesn't get eaten. Any species, the first rain that it comes, if anything that comes to that particular tree, if he eat the leaves, is going to kill the enzyme of that particular animal with the high uh, tenon and it's going to die that particular species. So the two species itself, it helps one another. The three, it helps well, You can see the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture but I've never actually seen them even once they've caught one. Um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go. Nearly got him. Hyena and hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Baby hippo jaws gaping. It's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds. Jamie, we look at the, the Comritam, uh, the Rhodesian bush willow one of the combritum that is common in the area, beautiful licking, large leaves. They're always around the uh, drainage line, but it happens that uh, about uh, 100, 150 meters off from the drainage line is where they've uh, decided to be. It's one of the uh, combritum that can grow big in the area. Not only this particular combritum, all the different species of the trees, they have this symbiotic relationship. That's the reason you will certainly find one of the branch on a tree is dead. That shows that uh, the tree itself, if they have an overflowing chemicals, that uh, if there's no much um, heavy, I mean, browser species that come and eat that particular leaves, it will send the chemical to one of the tree or one of the branch, and that particular branch, it will have overflowing of chemicals and is going to die and dry. That's the reason you can collect firewood out of here, out of these um, uh, trees that are still. Are surviving is how it actually works but the symbiotic relationship takes place and it limits all of that and the trees will be happy and the elephant will be happy around in the area and provide cover of course for each and every species out in the bush here because of lions and leopards they need cover as uh, all impala kudu and all that so the symbiotic relationship it flows in between the two species but it's something that of course you need to study and it's very complex to get into that um, scenario in order to understand how it works from plant material and animal apartment and animal life. What does all of this connect like a puzzle? And let us take this opportunity linked to Cedric with the big herbivores.
Yes, definitely indeed, Rexon. I think uh, is a circle of uh, life that happens around you in nature, which is always uh, wonderful. We do have lots of elephants around you on Niala North, and uh, they're all enjoying a good feed. But definitely they are, they've got a very important relationship to many animals around you. Of course, the elephants will be eating us berries and seeds and grasses and all kinds of vegetation. And only really 30% gets utilized. So that 70% that gets passed through an elephant's digestive system contains loads of uh, seeds and berries and things that have not been digested. And of course, the, once that comes out and the droppings are out, then you'll find things like squirrels and franklins and hornbills, they will all go through and they'll actually dig through the elephant's dung uh, to find some nice uh, vegetation seeds or like or a whole lot of different kinds of seeds in there and uh, grass seeds and little berries that haven't been digested. So there's a lot of little things inside of that elephant dung that helps a lot of animals around here. So that is a very, very important part of the ecosystem. As well, you'll find the dung beetles, very important, the large copper dung beetle. They rely on a lot on elephant dung. So, of course, those beetles will roll the elephant's dung into a ball and they will roll it off and uh, dig a hole. And then, of course, they will bury that dung ball. And inside that dung ball, they will lay the eggs. And one day, the little eggs will hatch into larvae and larvae will eat their, their, their way out. And... Uh, it's once again another circle of life. So very important for elephants actually having their droppings. So once again, uh, we will call that commensalism. So of course, it's just a one, one species that does benefit from it. All right, I'm just going to see if we can turn here. Oh, we've got a couple here coming here. Sorry, panda. Oh, we've got, oh, look at that little one. Look at that little one, panda. Look at that baby. Sorry, we're just on the other side of the vehicle. And there is a, a minute thing, maybe a couple of weeks old. Look at that with the little red hairs and the ears are still pinned back. Oh, that is so cute. All right, I can't go too far back. Our signal is not the greatest where we are at, the, at this point of time. So it is a little bit difficult on where we are. But let's see if I can... Uh, Panda, I'm going to try and come up the, onto the bank here. <laughs> If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a wild earth explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens. Each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. And you can see, definitely you can see that the grass is very short on this mound. Eh? You can see so many animals have been feeding on it. I think it's just that uh, it's a very nutritional grass that they get from these mounds. But it's wonderful. Hopefully everybody's enjoying a beautiful World Environmental Day. Yeah, well, that's... Uh, Josh, not all kinds of uh, dung, uh, Josh. I think uh, you'll find that, uh, like, I've never seen them really rolling, uh, like, hyena scat, uh, lion scat. I don't think they'll go anything for with a scat. The scat is from predators. So, and, of course, the dung they'll go for. So, dung is herbivores. So, they will roll from, like, elephant dung. Um, I've seen impala midden uh, dung piles. Yeah, a rhino dung. So there's a lot of different kind of dungs that they will roll. That's all from the herbivores, um, but not the scat or not feces. Now feces is omnivores. So that's your three different things. So scat is carnivores, dung, herbivores, and feces, omnivores. So I'll just see that the, definitely the, those dung beetles will mainly concentrate on 
the dung itself from all the herbivores. So not just the elephants, as I said, lots of different species around here. But they need it. If without that dung, there won't be dung beetles and we will lose definitely those species of uh, insects in this area. That's why I always say never drive over dung because you never know what's inside of that dung pile. A whole lot of little uh, dung beetles busy creating a nice little ball for themselves. And uh, if you drive over it, you squish them and it's not a good thing. Once again, it is good for conservation to you kind of just uh, go around those balls. Oh, well, there's a lot of elephants around here, I think. But as I said, there is a little birdie told me in my ear that there might be a lion up here at uh, Biffelzook Dam. So I'm going to head up that side now and just to see if we may be lucky, uh, we can find him there. But it's been a cool day, so it hasn't been too hot, at least. Ooh, yeah. well, that elephant just uh, let off a little bit of gas there. I can imagine a lot of uh, fermentation taking place in that bellies, all the fiber that they eat. And there's no, uh, it's not like what I think uh, they were saying as well earlier that uh, elephants pushing down trees, and creating like, you know, homes for a lot of animals, very important. That is, without them, there's a lot of a lot of animals that will not have homes if it wasn't for elephants. But anyway, let's head over to Rex and, and see how it is going on his safari. Welcome back from Cedric. We are just getting here from the hyena den. We found one of the hyena which is lying down at the moment. I have no idea which one is this one. Anyone that uh, joins us can help us. But hyena are the perfect, perfect um, uh, animals. Uh, really, between them and the lion, are the perfect uh, symbiotic relationship called uh, commercialism. It's really interesting. In most cases, you find that hyena will really wait until the lions move. When it comes to kills, a hyena will take over the leftover from the hyenas. By so doing, it helps quite a lot. They rely, in most cases, in some of the area. If the lion or lion hunt, when they are successful, hyena will come and scavenge. And that is the perfect, perfect uh, commercialism, symbiotic relationship. You tend to see them, they're doing with the other species, of course. There's also like, like one hyena on the entrance of the uh, mount itself, which uh, it's really land. Maybe it might be nesting. It will be a little bit difficult. You can see the ear sticking out. That means is now nesting at the moment. In some of the area, of course, it even extends. Uh, if you look at the uh, hyenas, they will hunt and the lion scavenge, then it will switch around. Perfect, I mean, also uh, example, being lion successful and have that relationship where the lion all the time will stay behind and listen for the commission of the hyena once they take down any prey and uh, go there and scavenge. And it's in the nature, you find that um, it will benefit from the hyena without uh, really impacting the hyena itself. In also hyena do the same without really impacting the alliance. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. As our global Wild Earth family grows, we know that many of you struggle to get your questions answered during the live safari. Going forward, we will be holding AMAs for our Wild Earth explorers on a regular basis. The first is with our resident leopard whisperer, Tristan Dix. Join me for an AMA on the 8th of June, straight after the Sunset Safari. This will be your chance to ask me anything you like. All you have to do is sign up to be an explorer, and you can meet me here on Juma with your questions ready.
<laughs> well done, Haina boy. One in a den is in the valley. I've been a guide for long, yeah. Uh, it, it, I'm still failing to identify all these hyenas. So if you find um, um, a, a, a hyena boy, which is really interested, following wild deaf and able to identify the different uh, hyenas that uh, in the era that makes even myself being a guide, I don't have that uh, experience to identify hyenas. It will be uh, the super, super uh, generation to really follow up on wildlife. Uh, I really appreciate it a lot in able to identify that particular individual hyena. So all of them that are lying down, they're still waiting to um, really get the signal in different areas. If a hyena get uh, a alarm call, of course, of a leopard in the area, they will all go in the same direction and try to go and scavenge as I was, we were talking about the world, I mean, environment day. It's such a beautiful, beautiful to get these all animals as they connect like a puzzle. They help one another. They have that uh, symbiotic relationship, of course. If there's anything back on that area, the impala will let the hyena, the present of a leopard or the present of a kill, and the hyena will take it there and benefit from the Impala itself and able to scavenge from the leopard. It's such an amazing, amazing thing how things connect out in nature. The same with all this um, plant material that are here. They also connect it, helps one another. Of course, for instance, I'll take an example with the Amarula trees that is close by and uh, 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 large fruited bush willow. In most cases, if there's any danger in the area or trees pushing pushed by the uh, elephant, the Amarula will signal and the other species will benefit. Even if it's a different species of a tree, they will be able to read that danger and be ready for any danger in that particular area. So everything connects. They have a very good symbiotic relationship to help one another, which is such an interesting in life. To celebrate World Oceans Day and create awareness for the role that the oceans play in everyday life, Wild Earth has some brand new dive line merchandise in our shop. T-shirts, sweatshirts, bags and even caps. So take the plunge, head over to our shop and see what you can find. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. We only have one Earth. This phrase highlights the challenges of collective action between nations. It emphasizes the great test of our time. Achieving environmental change cannot be met by countries acting alone. Head over to the Wild Earth Shop to buy your only One Earth merchandise and create awareness for global change this World Environment Day. It is really interesting. The termite mount is living. There's a termite inside. There's a guarantee because the new form. And the hyena, they are dwelling inside. There's quite a lot of cavities inside here. The, derma, the termite mount itself, they might avoid the bottle, but the humidity that takes place, that created by the, all the shaft that um, termite mount have created all the way down to the surface. It creates a heat. Anything that lives inside the termite mount, especially youngster in this kind of overheat it's really getting a little bit uh, more uh, heat inside that's reason is um, the uh, hyena puppies that are inside they're not outside because inside is very warm at the moment that is one of the symbiotic relationship that the animals uh, enter into with the termite mount and these uh, hyenas And let's take this opportunity to uh, go over to Taylor in Prideland. I am out of the car once again. I get itchy feet. Anyways, I found something beautiful in the bush. They are purple and white flowers, a perfect combination of the two. And these flowers belong to a Dermakar puzzle bush. 
And that's an Afrikaans word, dear Mirka. It kind of, it, it's a word that I suppose people could use to describe me kind of all over the place. And that's very much how these sort of trees grow. You can kind of see they're very sort of scrappy, these long branches that creep all over. They have no idea where they're going. This is just a very small one. And there's also fruits, but BK, we're gonna have to look down here. There are some nice fruits that you can see. And this is the first time I've ever seen fruit on a puzzle bush tree before. They are not ready to be eaten. These are not uh, not enticing. I suspect that they're going to turn a deep purple uh, coloration when they'll be ripe. Whether or not I will be able to get one in the next few days, with the race is on between myself, the vervet monkeys, and any of the bird species. But anyway, something else that I read, which was quite interesting, um, and I have to I have to tell you about it very quickly is you have to take the powdered roots of this puzzle bush tree with the hair from the head of a goat, very specific, and you can sprinkle it on warriors and it's supposed to bring them good luck, which is quite cool. Anyways, off we go to Cedric and maybe he's at Biffle's Hook, maybe he's got the lions. That is so interesting, very cool to hear that. I like to hear. I think I should throw some on me. <laughs> but I've got line tracks going up this way from Biffelzook cut line. I mean, Biffelzook dam heading this side. I'm not too sure if I got them. The road is just so hard here. Yeah? I'm not too sure if I still got them here. Yeah? Um, this uh, yeah. Yes, I still got them. Still going up this way. I don't know if they've really crossed Biffles or cut line. I'm hoping not, because uh, it looks like it has been a, not a warm day. It's been pretty cool. So, uh, being a cool day like this, um, unfortunately, uh, lines will still maybe move a little bit more compared to a normal or very hot day. So, I'm just going to try and take a look if see if we. Last time we had the three Mkumas and the seven Cubs with uh, Mohawk right here. That was about a few days ago, about a week ago. A few days, a week ago? I'm fine, I'm lost, lost of days. I think about a week ago. All right, let's take a look. Do I see anything still coming up here? Yes, looks like they're still going up here. Uh, Dick, good, uh, good morning, oh, good afternoon. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, yes, I'm hoping lions myself, Dick. I'm just a little bit worried. We are very close to um, the Biffelzook boundary here. A little bit close, but let's see. I think, yeah, oh, I don't know if that is lion tracks or if it's not. What is that? Yeah, it's lion tracks. Still going all the way up. Oh, but Dick, yes, I'm hoping myself. I'm not gonna cross fingers and toes and everything else, and uh, I'm hoping that we find some lions here, because we didn't get them this morning. Well, we had fantastic leopard this morning, so it's amazing how things will change up again. But uh, uh, talking about that, I had at Lulumba's tracks coming north on Vulture's Nest. So I think while we were sitting with Lulumba's two cubs this morning, we had uh, the tracks coming all the way up. Uh, and that's when we heard that uh, kudu alarm call. And oopsie. Take a look, yeah, they're still going up. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're coming up to Biffles of Cut Line now. Well, you never know, maybe they're still on the, all on the ground. Maybe Odie will tell me something. Odie, I think Odie's, uh, he's a good one that came up. I know Odie will say something now. Where, Odie, which way, which way? Mm -hmm. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. 
there are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. And we'll continue searching for these line tracks. The last ones are just here. Now I just want to see where they turned. Uh, let's head over to Rexon with these hyenas. Welcome back uh, from uh, Cedric, who is looking for lions around Befesuk. We have Swazi right here in Ndebele, very close to the entrance of the Termat Mount. Hyena, they have a long lasting relationship amongst one another, More especially if they're born in a particular clan, they will live for life. And for instance, if one get injured, the others they will be able, able to help that individual, more especially when it comes to hunting. They have an ability, these species, if they do come across the kills, maybe more especially if they want to interact with lions or leopards, they can really call and help one another. Just because they have that uh, long-lasting relationship, these such amazing, amazing species, they work together all the time, and they really uh, love one another, especially when it comes to the same clan of a hyena. It's not uh, really... If another hyena gets into the area, it depends. I've seen time and again, they have similarity with the wild dogs. A wild dog, uh, a strong male can move one part to another. It's exactly the same with the uh, hyenas. They can choose the male that uh, really uh, mate within the structure of a matriarch. Remember, they have similarities again with lions, leopards, they that uh, they cannot really mate with their own offspring all the time in the area. The male that bonds in the area, they might move into other areas. And they can allow also a, a new blood circulate within the, uh, the, the clan itself. And also remember, because they are so territorial, they have that complex to choose the male that they want because they are dominating in the male and the male is more submissive to the female. That is in the nature of hyena. Of course, this is one of the most interesting species when it comes to hunting and be in the surrounding. Remember, the hyena is one of the species that can communicate far distances. They can have different uh, calls that they can really relocate and try to even invite the members of their clan once they come across with an opportunity. We know all the time when a hyena goes out from the clan, they look for opportunity, more especially the animal that uh, is really weak in the surrounding. They will try to focus on those and bring down. It's not only a hyena that have the same sort of attitude. Lion is the same, leopard is the same. There's raising survival of the fittest. If you're not fit with all competition that um, is really out in nature, it might be uh, really become so... Are you a fan of the Juma clan? If the answer to this is yes, then you are cordially invited to our Hyena Hullabaloo starting on the 13th of June. During this week, we want to take a trip down memory lane. Please send in your favorite Juma clan moments to hyena at wildearth.tv by the 7th of June and we will dig into our archives and try our hardest to play it out during this week of Hyena celebrations. This is amazing, and now she's headed towards the elephants. Yeah, here comes the male behind us. This is the male lion coming over here. He's got... The elephants have huddled up to protect the young ones in the middle, and he's going after that girl. And they are the buffalo going after the lion and the lioness. They're still going after them. Look at that guy charging! Hey! really amazing we have seen different part of lions um, the way they really uh, choose the area of the youngster to hurt them some of them they prefer very thick 
habitat, some of them, they prefer an area where it's not thick, maybe on top of the termite mud. It's dependent, but the very good um, uh, parental care it uh, is from the hyenas, because what does, oh, look at that, other one's just coming from. Let us link to Cedric, who is checking the lions around Befes with them. Yes, I'm on Biffles Hook uh, cut line now at this point in time. I did pick up on those lion tracks. As you can see, uh, the big uh, lion spur. This is very much the front uh, paw and, of course, then the back uh, paw. Yeah. Okay, so what is happening here? Yeah, while it's a lion, uh, you can see the three lobes. If I can just point out to you, the three lobes at the back. There's three lobes at the back pad and then, of course, the four pugs in front. And not long ago, it's very flat. You can see these lines were here maybe about, I'll say, not even longer than an hour ago due to the fact of that there is a lot of wind and uh, this is still very hard in the center of the back pad itself. So this is a female. Yeah, we've got one. We've got actually got three females coming across here. And then it's just a perfect example now between a lion uh, track and a leopard track. Now you can see how big a female leopard track is. This is a female leopard track. And it's very small. Okay, it's a very small. That's got the one, two, three lobes with the four pugs on here as well, compared to a lion track. And the way to actually just to uh, determine or to show you the sizes of them, let's go to the lion track first. Now, you know how big a chicken egg is, but we'll put Odie's uh, thing up. So Odie will just sit there. So you can actually see how big that lion spur is compared to Odie. Okay, and then I'll take that one and I'll put it next to the leopard track and you'll actually see how big the leopard track is. It's almost the same size. It's just a little bit bigger than Odie. All right, so it just shows you the difference where a leopard track is about maybe three times smaller than a lion uh, track. But this leopard track is not uh, fresh, maybe from last night or maybe from uh, early uh, or late uh, yesterday afternoon that time. So I'll just take that. Odie has come with us again. Unfortunately, three females, so it's a one year. The second one has come over this side. Here's the second one. So it's one female, two female, going over, and then a third one. It must be the Nkumas, or it could actually be the Talamatis, and there's the third one going over. So it's three females going straight into Buffalzook, and not long ago, it's on top of the vehicle tracks, and uh, it's very, very fresh. Unfortunately, we cannot follow there, so we are going to move on from here. So hopefully we can make a turn around, and uh, I think let's follow up on uh, those tracks of Tlalama from this afternoon. I think that'll be a good idea. Well, let's jump on. <sighs> Anyway, let's uh, head back to Rexon while he's sitting at the hyena den. Welcome back from Cedric checking the Pride of Lions that's cross over. We have nothing to do. They are mortied and off. We, it seems like uh, the puppies are starting to be active at the moment. It might give us a little bit of entertainment because where the youngsters are involved is quite a lot of playing I mean, biting, running around, more especially if the mothers are on site. I was talking earlier on about parental care of the hyena. Hyena is such amazing because as they're having a, a, a den in a den site, the most of the hyena they are not far from this area, and they left these two female here as a guardian. If anything comes into the area, the high pitch giggling, it will be a signal to show that danger into the den. The whole clan will come and start to fight. There's reason you find that the leopard that I experience, they respect very well the den side of uh, hyenas. Also from the lions, they really respect the den side of the lion. If you find a leopard coming towards the leopard den, it might be not yet experienced about how hyena can defend themselves. 
but um, it happens a lot that if he do comes here, it will be a lesson that he's going to uh, get from the hyenas. He would never ever come back into the surrounding. It's such amazing how hyena defend. I've witnessed that in my life. Scottish Lawrence, as your underwater biologist. We have a turtle! So this is the knife symbol for a turtle. So today is not any ordinary day, it is World Ocean Day. Hello everyone from sunny Namibia. My name is Cameron Pierce and this year I'll be representing Ongava Game Reserve at the Safari Guide of the Year 2022 edition. You know a lot of people have asked me what it would be like to win the competition and it would obviously be an incredible privilege but uh, even just to be selected as one of the five finalists is an honor that I, I never expected and special to be a part of it for this year. due to the carcasses that might be brought into a den of bones that might uh, really cause the bacteria, different bacteria that might be take place inside the den and bacteria might uh, cause diseases as far as different uh, bacteria that might be or different carcasses that might be brought in here from different animals, but especially if for instance one have um, anthrax, you may find that uh, uh, the den itself if it's not changed by the uh, females here now and then the youngster that might end up get sick so it's in the nature of this hyena sometimes you find them in the next door and furthermore to the other side they keep on switching in between the two uh, three different area of uh, denning let us take this opportunity and link to taylor who is having a beautiful predator We do have a tiny little predator, one that also likes to use termite mounds, but they're not in a termite mound at the moment. We are looking at one dwarf mongoose. There are a couple more which keep poking their heads out every now and then. And I think as long as the sun stays around without the cloud cover, which we're currently experiencing, they should stay put on the road because it is really chilly today. And I'm sure everyone has mentioned that about 30,000 times already. But, you know, when you're a mongoose, you're also a worshipper of the sun. And you can see that this one, this individual, which looks like an adult, is quite fluffed up at the moment, waiting very patiently for the sun to poke its nose out behind the clouds. And there's a couple of little, I wouldn't call them pups, they're a bit older than that, I suppose, juveniles, trotting about too. So hopefully they're going to come out into the road. But these are one of my favorite little animals to watch. I can spend hours and hours watching them and I always encourage people that just because they duck into the bushes when you first see them, don't just drive past, just pull off the side of the road, sit quietly, make sure you're at a decent distance away and they normally come out. Well, for the most part, of course. Remember, some animals might not be super comfortable with the vehicles, but typically dwarf mongo, mo dwarf mongos, no, that's not what they're called, dwarf mongos, <laughs> well, will poke their little heads out and there's also a lot of bird life that's coming around and fluttering about i don't know bk can you see up on top of the that dead tree we're gonna have a quick look before it decides to fly away and i just want to show you how windy it is so that's a forktail drongo right up on the top of a tree holding on for dear life. I don't know why it's chosen the smallest branch to sit on. I don't know if it's so it can get a bit higher and see a bit further, um, but a good opportunity to hang around the dwarf mongoose as the very much, I suppose, just like the big mammals when they move around, drongos will follow them as they disturb insects. It's gonna be a bit difficult for that drongo. Ah, there's a, another little mongoose that's now come out and I believe we have a question from Yvette. 
Oh, look, you see, there's a whole bunch of them now. Yvette, you've asked, do dwarf mongoose also target active termite mounds? L Lynette? Annette? I'm so sorry that I'm completely butchering your name. Oh, do they only target... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting into trouble because I'm not getting the names right. Um, no, they don't necessarily. They actually will utilize many other things. So I can see the mongoose have actually just run, run around the corner. I'm going to drive in just a moment. Let me answer your question because I think that they're just out um, ahead of us. So no, they um, will also target fallen logs, any little crevice and cavity that they can absolutely find. You know, they're very opportunistic. However, they're going to prefer to have a nice safe space and termite mounds, as it has been discussed, generate a fair amount of heat. And that's obviously great when you are trying to keep warm, especially because the temperature drops so much. Okay, I'm going to go forward and then let's see if we can find those mongoose again because there's also some hornbills flying around now, which could always be entertaining. My name is Liam Henderson. I'm a guide at the Homestead Lodge on Nambiti Private Game Reserve in KwaZulu Natal. I think Safari Guide of the Year is a great competition to be a part of. I'm somewhat nervous for the tracking part of the competition, as being in KZN now, uh, I've been haven't been exposed to the low felt animals and tracks and signs that are so apparent up there. My name is Nico Britz. I am originally from Cape Town. I worked in the Eastern Cape for about nine years before I started working at Bushwise Field Guides in the Low Felt, uh, close to Makalali Private Game Reserve. So I'm hoping that by doing this, this could inspire the younger or newer guides coming into the industry to do the same. Oh, that was quite cool. Oh no. Come back, Hornbill. Come back, Mongoose. At least one Mongoose is there just in that patch of sun, just waiting it out. It's, it's quite a big colony. They're all disappearing down and around the corner. Probably not going to follow them. Oink, they keep dashing right in front of my car, but uh, you're not going to be able to see them very well. They're so quick. That one has now disappeared. I think they're going to head to bed early. I said to BK that I'm actually going to start searching and taking note of... Uh, I suppose a termite mound where the mongoose are living so that we can wait for them in the morning and eventually see them come out of their, you know, their little burrow, wherever they're sleeping and watch the whole process of them warming up uh, using the luxury facilities, you know, that whole, that whole thing, which is quite a cool interaction to see. But I'm going to shoot around the corner to Buffalo uh, Dam and see what's happening over here. Off we go to Rexon and it seems like the cubs have got a bit of a spring in their step. Welcome back from Taylor. It looks like the all hyena puppies are coming out. It's really, really interesting. I mean, watching them, how they interact with their mother. One call from uh, one of these hyena here, it triggered all these youngsters inside to come out and start to be like uh, really playing with one another. It's, it's a good signal while we're listening here and look at how actually the mother ground very low and calling and as is from now while i'm here you can hear the female is really calling this kind of a behavior with the hyena you can tell here who is dominating from one another the female that's in top look like a dominating female that is on the ground trying to really get the scent in between the two legs to sniff on the sexual part in order to understand what the female up to. Remember, all the cats out in the bush, you can simply get to see that um, who is the dominant, one that always do uh, quite a lot of things and try to uh, really show that uh, is more stronger than the others, you'll be able to identify. Uh, you know, I have similar behavior with the wild dogs, but the wild dogs, just because of the species itself, there are species that move all the time. They don't want to really uh, stay in one particular area. What might be the problem of that due to the predators, of course. While the, once the cubs, I mean the puppies are three months old, they will move quite a lot from one place to another. And always following the um, 
uh, animals to hunt in some of the area of course it, the they become more successful in some of the area due to environment they tend to be not uh, really doing well when it comes to hunting they are unlike uh, hyenas that they can permanently stay at the one uh, uh, den and uh, let the youngster grow up so high, the wild dogs will all move and there will be some behavior of breeding when it comes to breeding the all that uh, they have reached sexual maturity or the oldest female in the pack is the one that's going to uh, really breed and they can continuously break uh, down once they get into big numbers they will be break away within the uh, wild dogs and each and every group will go its own way and start their own new life but here on the hyena it's a long i mean Hello everyone, my name is Ruan Grobler. I'm from Lion Sands Game Reserve and being nominated for the Safari Guide of the Year came as somewhat of a surprise to me. I was very excited and quite nervous as well in the beginning uh, to tackle this task. But it's, it's, it's quite a prestigious event and it, it means that you are recognized and I'm quite happy to be recognized. It means quite a lot to me. My name is Solomon Lobu. I am working at Singita Kruger National Park. I am very excited today to be one of the guys that have been nominated to select it to participate in the Safari Guide of the Year. I'm an activator. Uh, I like starting something, motivating others to become better. I am positive. You know, I like to um, focus on the positive side of the situation. It's really linked to Cedric, who's got a beautiful owl for us. Yes, look who we have here. We've got a little pearl spotted owlet. Absolutely stunning. Yeah, of course, you know that the pearl spotted owlet is one of our diurnal owls that we do have around here. Yeah? So that is so nice to see him and uh, very much here in a little open for us to view. I love that little angry face of theirs. <laughs> so nice. As you know, they do mainly feed on invertebrates so around these areas and those are little, little lizards, uh, geckos, skinks, anything like that. And uh, yes, I've also seen them feed on uh, even little insects as well, like grasshoppers if they have to. But they are one of our smallest owls that we do, and that's why we call it an owlet. And of course, as I said, they are definitely more often uh, active uh, by day. But yeah, it hunts uh, mostly by day, but calls mostly, of course, at night time. And they got that beautiful noise that. Beautiful noise, but he just flew off. Bye bye. Oh, well, that was nice. <laughs> what a good uh, thing. Um, I haven't seen a pull spotted outlet for quite some time, and especially during the daytime. I know the sun was just at a bad angle there, but uh, wow, that was fantastic to see that. Eh? What a fantastic moment. All right, well, let's continue. I'm on Central, so looks like uh, it is all happening. It is all, all happening. Uh, Rudy, yes, a very sweet little owl that. It is absolutely a sweet little owl. But talking about owls now, because it is one of the nicest symbiotic relationships here when it comes to birds, and one of them is uh, involves an owl. Of course, that's called a Verose eagle owl. Of course, one of our largest owls that we do have here now. Where these two species help each other is where a hummercorp, uh, one of the birds that always hangs around the water, has got like a, a head of a, a shape, or his head is shaped like a hammer, and uh, that's why we call it a hummercorp. Uh, he makes these big nests, these huge, huge nests around you. They kind of build these nests for years and years and years, and they never end, end off uh, like uh, just stopping and not building anymore. They continue. And what happens is in these verose eagle owls, they'll actually go and use their nest, but not inside the nest where the hummercorp will go inside, the uh, Verose eagle owl, they will actually go nest on top 
of the Hamakop's uh, nest. So on top of that is now the Hamakop is getting now, uh, or pretty much giving a home to the Varose eagle owl. And of course the Varose eagle owl is keeping the Hamakop's chicks safe if there's anything like maybe a slender mongoose or even a snake that comes through there. Of course the Varose eagle owl being a bird of prey, it will protect of course uh, that nest. And of course that's where the Hamakop gets its protection from if there is a Varose eagle owl there. So we all call that a mutualism relationship between the Varose eagle owl and the Hamakop. Of course, each one has got something to gain from that relationship. So yeah, very nice. Nice to see little outlets. I'm very happy to see that. Oh, there goes my mic. Oh, my earpiece. Right, let's continue. Come on, Rusty. Why is Rusty so... I think it's like cold. Don't be so cold. Don't be so cold. As we are going to continue down uh, central, I'm going to still try and follow up on Columba and her cubs, the tracks that we had just now. Let's head over to Rexon and these hyena cubs. Welcome back from uh, uh, tragic with having a, a power spot as an outlet. We are really increasing numbers of the uh, hyenas here. One hyena just joined in at the moment. It can really see that uh, the youngster, they're all like uh, giving a little bit of uh, um, high giggling and pitching, look like more excited to get this female coming back here. Yeah, of course, I mean, earlier on I was talking about uh, the populations of the um, hyena in the era is doing well. Hyena more successful in the era because really food is very encouraging when it comes to population. These hyena here, they are more successful when it comes to hunt and also more successful when it comes to scavenging. You won't believe that uh, the amount of leopard that in the area, they lose quite a lot from the hyenas. Also the leopard do quite a lot. I mean, helping the uh, leopard to be surviving in the area, that kind of a symbiotic relationship is such huge. It's not just because the hyena or leopard wants to lose the kill, but due to have more leopards in the area, it helps also when they kill and left uh, some pieces of meat or left the kill on the ground, hyena will come and pick that. Or even interacting from the leopard is how actually they get to be more successful when it comes to uh, their own survival and also the breeding of the hyena. Really amazing. And the healthy of the area, the habitat itself is very healthy. It, it can able, really for sure, if you look at the the area of Juma Conservancy, is very thick. That also gets these hyenas and the I mean, hyenas also more successful when it comes to even hunting, for instance, impala or not even hunting impala, if impala gets to be really healthy, anything that hunts them and uh, they will the hyena to scavenge on that. To scavenge on that, they eat healthy food, that's raising also the success of these hyenas very high. I'm not sure, it looks like uh, this little one, it does have something interesting. If it's not uh, a bone of uh, uh, animal, I'm not sure what might be, but it's coming with it uh, from the uh, mount itself. It looks like a joint of a leg of impala. That could be possible. There's reason all of them, you can see, they're chasing one another. It does start to be competing with the bone itself. Now the hyena, it's one of the species when it comes to symbiotic relationship uh, in the area, it do quite uh, very well. Remember, The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. 
Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. Of course, it helps all species out in nature, including a human being. Sometimes human life and plant life and animal life, it's all connected. It's just a matter of we, we don't dig information and able to see what is the most important uh, with these particular animals. The hyena everywhere around in the area, you find them, they really uh, defecate uh, uh, more white feces and that uh, if it's really hot or weathered by the weather in the area, when it rains as it overcasts in the area, when the rains on the ground, it washes the calcium back to the system of the soil that benefited by a lot of species, of course, when they drink water, they have calcium, the grass itself, they have all these minerals that they want, even plant itself, So, which means everything is connected. Without a hyena, we'll never ever get uh, uh, the uh, manufacturing of the uh, calcium around in the area. which is eight years old, they have seen hyena hunt or scavenge. Yes, hyena in, in this surrounding, the reason why they're so successful in breeding, as you can see all these youngsters, the 50% of their hunt, they do at their own, 50% they scavenge. If there's no kill from a leopard in around in the area, they're not going to sit and wait for a leopard and lion to make a kill. Remember, Lions can move from one part to another. All the time they might be moving away from here, they have to make a kill. <laughs> that is excited. I was talking earlier on about hyena eating bones. So like now, let us take a look and listen. The crunching of the bone is such amazing. I will be silent. Talking about calcium, hyena in front of us, they're eating bones there. It looks like it could be the front uh, bone of the impala, the front leg of the impala, that brought by maybe the adult early on during the night. The youngster maybe keep it away from here and just brought it out. And did a little bit of competition from there. If you look at on my side here, you see how these young hyena, there's so much pressure curious with the vehicle they start to bite our vehicle tires all the rubbers even biting our shoes they do that sometimes because young hyena anything because they have teeth that always itchy they need to bite all the time is how actually the muscle has been trained for the hyena while they're still young they have a very strong muscle jaws of course for the hyenas as reason they manage to crack bones as you can hear. Now and then you can hear the excitement from this hyena. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. If you are a Wild Earth Explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colours. A very useful tote bag or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. 
head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Rosemary, yes, of course. It's so cute to see all of them together and also playing together, interacting uh, before the mother moves away in the era. Remember, soon after dark, uh, these uh, other female, they will all go in their own direction, try to uh, really hunt and bring food for the youngster um, in the area. They have to hunt or they have to go and scavenge. This is one of the species, of course, in the area, quite a lot you find that uh, they are working more or less like vultures. If anything dies natural, they're going to consume it easy and clean the habitant. And of course, with the, the relationship or symbiotic relationship that the hyena has in the area, such amazing, is one of the species, of course, it have a very good relationship with other species sometimes you tend to see with the um, I, I mean wild dogs and so sometimes they can even try to be really following wild dog all the time and benefit from the, the wild dog if they do eat something because wild dog they don't really want to crash bones the hyena will come all the time after the wild dogs have uh, finished the kill and really clean the area as they move but what's amazing with the hyena if one of these individuals die, nothing eats them. Even a vulture cannot descend on the area. It decompose the ground. It, fed, it makes the ground more fertile for the new, for grass for the next season. Let's just, uh, link or let us uh, go uh, over to Taylor in Plant and see what she might have on the site. Rexon, I so badly wanted to jump on board the hyena train today, but apparently Mother Nature has different ideas. We're at uh, the the main den, well, what used to be the main den at Pridelands, but I haven't been here since January, so I honestly don't know if it is even active anymore, or perhaps something like a warthog or porcupine or aardvark or some other creature has taken up residence. It's very quiet, and what I'm most sad about, and I'm very sad that the hyenas aren't here, is that there's a there's a tiny little hole and I'm, I'm sure i've told you a little bit about it before it's right above the main entrance of uh, this this termite mound which looks very much like an abandoned termite mound too now that's created by little bee eaters and i wanted to show you a picture in my book but i can't because it's my, the oldest bird book ever it's all stuck together i'll show you in a minute so you can have a laugh it's a bit sad though anyways they're not even here normally the there's a pair of uh little bee eaters and they're always fluttering around and i was like okay well if the hyenas don't come out then you know at least i'll be able to show you the bee eaters not today Maybe they're already in there. Anyways, but I wanted to show you a picture very quickly. Not of a yellow, not a, I keep wanting to say yellow bee eater. That's not a thing. Little bee eater. Um, it's down over here. And what I wanted to show you, it's quite a funny picture. It's not of the little bee, bee eater. This is a carmine bee eater, a southern carmine bee eater. They're really beautiful. They're magenta in color. I suppose you might find one or two in this area, but very unlikely but this is how they dig their little tunnels because again how i was confused about how on earth does that bag worm put acacia thorns onto its onto little silken uh, thread i'm assuming how on earth does a bird dig a burrow because they don't have these massive claws or you know powerful legs and arms obviously their arms are, are very much uh, modified in in the form of wings but this is quite a cool little illustration so here they talk about how the bee eater and this this goes for all bee eaters is how they use their beaks and their wings like a tripod and sort of prop themselves up and then they move those little delicate legs very quickly and they kick all the sand out so that's why they they typically will use sand banks or mud banks where the soil is very hard uh, I mean very soft I, I imagine that the hole that we were looking at just a moment ago it might have already started as something maybe there was some kind of uh, reptile that had already burrowed in and created it and then the bee eaters have just sort of modified it to make it they're home ready and that's what they do animals are constantly modifying and changing i mean i don't know if you can remember from a little 
during the peak of COVID, it would have been 2020 June or probably about two years ago now, how different this mound looked like. This mound actually was completely covered in grass and we didn't have this big main entrance here either. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens, each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! now as I am starting to doubt that this uh, old den is even active anymore we heard some grunts and gurgles just coming to this uh, from the south of us just over here sounded like buffalo can't say I smelt a buffalo but we'll we'll head around and do a little bit of investigating be quite, I, I was gonna say I don't know when I last saw buffalo and then that was gonna be a complete lie because I've just seen so many buffalo in Tanzania all of the buffalo, huge herds of buffalo in fact. It's actually been a long time since I'd seen the big herds. Oh, I can remember how to re reverse. I also haven't driven a manual for a while. Cool. Right, we're gonna go and investigate on the sounds that we heard. Could have been my tummy, I'm a bit hungry. Cedric, however, doesn't seem to be hungry, but he's tracking Tlalamba, and she might be. <laughs> it sounds like my stomach. Uh, I think my stomach grumbles uh, day in and day out. I think this morning at uh, Columbus to two cubs, when we had them this morning, at, uh, my stomach went crazy. And I think old Panda thought he was being uh, charged by a, a leopard or something. <laughs> but yeah, my tummy's bad. All right, we've got, uh, looks like Columbus tracks. We were following Columbus tracks all around um, just for her coming up this side out of the Molawati. It looks like she has come up here on top of the vehicle tracks. Um, we're just double checking exactly. It is, it's freshish. I mean, there's another little track on top of her track here. I'm not too happy about that. Um, it looks like maybe a squirrel or something that ran past here on top of her track. But I mean, that's, it's always that squirrel could have ran past not long ago. Another track of hers there. And um, yeah, see, it is not so bad. It's a, a beautiful little track here. You got the panda? You can see those three little lobes at the back and the four pugs next to each other coming up the side and of course that one there. So I think she must have gone Mulawati all the way around. But the problem is yeah, I don't I don't see the cub tracks here. I know that uh, when we were on uh, Vulture's Nest now coming down from Vulture's Nest, uh, I had all three of their tracks. And I've just got her track here. So I'm not too sure if this was a track that when she was on her way uh, towards the Cubs this morning. And that's why it's not uh, too fresh. That's why I'm not too convinced about this being the freshest of all the tracks that we've seen so far. So I'm not going to continue with this track. I think what we should do is we'll go back towards uh, uh, Spaghetti Crossing and continue looking from that side. And I know that she likes to keep her cubs as well around that crossing itself. So I'm just going to take all these things out. Rosemary, good, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Yes, definitely come on, Clalumbo, because it's, a, it's Sunday fun day today. So we've got to definitely find at least another little cat for the afternoon because we weren't able to get those lines those lines seemed like they were they went over they went over into buffalo so that was definitely an unsuccessful one but 
a fleet lumber will make her appearance. I don't think it's too far. That's when we heard those this morning when we were sitting with the lumber's cubs. We heard the uh, kudu's alarm calling this morning. And uh, that is alarm calling coming from maybe Chilapan. <sighs> um, around that side. I'm going to search, but if it was Ingwe Alley, I think I've cut a long time in, but Hamilton, and at the crossings, there is, like in the Malawati, there is like a fallen over tree and things there that she sometimes likes to lie there and stash her cubs there. All right, let's head over to Rexon, see what he's up to. Welcome back uh, from Cedric. We are still the hyena. The number of female look they extended up to four. There are two, three behind, I mean, three in the entrance of the mount itself. Amazing. One just went inside uh, calling, look like one of the youngsters. I might be still sleeping, try to attract the youngster to come out on the barrow in order to be active. Such amazing with these uh, hyena. All these uh, different litters that are here, I believe most of them are females and that will make the um, population of this land not to die especially if they do have females it means that uh, the uh, uh, clan itself it will be continuously into the surrounding males as our global wild earth family grows we know that many of you struggle to get your questions answered during the live safari Going forward, we will be holding AMAs for our Wild Earth Explorers on a regular basis. The first is with our resident leopard whisperer, Tristan Dix. Join me for an AMA on the 8th of June, straight after the Sunset Safari. This will be your chance to ask me anything you like. All you have to do is sign up to be an explorer, and you can meet me here on Juma with your questions ready. To celebrate World Oceans Day, and create awareness for the role that the oceans play in everyday life. Wild Earth has some brand new Dive Live merchandise in our shop. T-shirts, sweatshirts, bags and even caps. So take the plunge, head over to our shop and see what you can find. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. They all look like it's ready. Uh, really uh, charging these young around the, the mountain, let the other one, maybe there is a tiny little one here that need to come out. I was saying 80% of the body of an animal physically, if it's healthy, it will give birth as well. Okay, it can happen, but in, in most cases, how design these wild animals are very clever. Some of these uh, uh, barrels, they go a little bit up. Even if it floods, it cannot reach the certain uh, area where the youngster might be. And they can design themselves inside, most especially having youngster, to be in the area where it's always comfortable, even it rains in, in the surrounding. <coughs> but remember, these animals are a lot more clever. If you look at the interest of all these, uh, of the uh, dan itself or hyenas, they all face to the north. Our rain comes from the south to the north. So there's no uh, easy for these uh, uh, dan to flood it. If you look at the interest of that, we're slightly facing uh, south southwest so it can get water but it cannot reach the certain level inside but most of them the entrance facing north or even if you look at the red weaver that all these species of birds that build communal nests they nest are always on the northern side of the tree all the time knowing that the wind and the water and the rain comes from the south and as it go to north it cannot able to disturb the uh, nest itself also the den itself it will always safe so you see how nature uh, can be so much sensitive 
it's really amazing how this animal can really able to figure out themselves without the interference of human being. Sometimes we tend to really put ourselves into position that we know more than all these animals are in nature and that is incorrect. It's not the reality. The animals itself without interference of human being, they can survive. Again, uh, I was sitting here uh, and looking for information why this uh, hyena population is so uh, growing in big numbers around in the area. If I take a look back in the history of Mapoho and Machingeland, there's a lot of hyena that will get uh, uh, killed in the nature balance of uh, environment around in the area. Due to, oh, look at that, it's a tiny little baby. Wow, there's reason the mom was calling. Oh, what good is that? Look at that. Wow. Unbelievable. We are lucky to see this. Two of them. A few weeks old. Wow. This is unbelievable. The reason why the mother was going inside the tenement and calling was trying to encourage the youngster to come out. Does anyone have seen these puppies before? Again, with the interest facing towards the direction of south, I mean southwest, the weather, it might be really encouraging the female to move the youngster from the other entrance and put them in the other side. That it might be uh, the reason why. I, I might be really guessing, but most of the time these animals, they can know what can happen in three hours time before we even know. We only have one Earth. This phrase highlights the challenges of collective action between nations. It emphasizes the great test of our time. Achieving environmental change cannot be met by countries acting alone. Head over to the Wild Earth Shop to buy your only One Earth merchandise and create awareness for global change this World Environment Day. Are you a fan of the Juma clan? If the answer to this is yes, then you are cordially invited to our Hyena Hullabaloo starting on the 13th of June. During this week, we want to take a trip down memory lane. Please send in your favorite Juma clan moments to hyena at wildearth.tv by the 7th of June and we will dig into our archives and try our hardest to play it out during this week of Hyena celebrations. I believe in the era Okay, indeed, Juma clan looking healthy. If you look at the environment, it's also healthy. Anything that they eat around in the area is very healthy. That encourage the, or the impala or the steenbok, whatever they hunt in the area. Wow, look at that. Wow. The youngster is calling. different sound. While they're still young, they give different, completely sound with the the young one that does above like three to four months old. It looks like it's really tapping when it calls. Unbelievable. With all due to the clients in the population, soon we get male lions that comes in numbers. All this land is going to uh, really decrease because the male lions, they will be always around in the area and some of these female or these puppies that are going to be killed, especially during the kills or big kills, giraffe, buffalo, having four male lions that comes in the area. In most cases, they really kills hyenas. Male lion, it also play a very important role when it comes to uh, nature balance out here. You've seen quite a lot <laughs> where males get into the area and settle with the female soon there's a hyena's activity they really chase the hyena off even the hyena themselves the reason why they stay in particular area like this there is no much uh, male involved in the pride 
So when there's a dominant mouse that uh, comes in numbers here, this line is going to move into different areas. They'll start to notice danger around in the area. But it's unbelievable. Yeah, look at that. That's a shot. Wow. Finally, the mother FJ able to uh, move the youngster in different location. Dark man lover asking if if I think hyena is the best uh, mothers in the bush. Yes, of course, because they use dance all the all the time. Look at the youngster yeah, just change from the uh, other entrance is less than five meters away and put them in the other entrance. The reason why the other species they look like not good mothers all the time they have to change den in in. in in different area and they have to walk kilometers during that uh, walk in between the cubs if they caught into uh, other leopards or lions or it could be a lion against leopard you're going to lose the cubs so the hyena they stationary in one point that makes the chances of this youngster to survive up to adulthood is very high than the leopard that has to always change uh, all the time. I'll take an example with uh, Talamba. Talamba, we realized when she was having cubs, she was moving them in the very thick area in the drainage line. Try to avoid something like that uh, where the lions or hyena, they can get the youngster into different area where they cannot able to defend themselves while they're still young. So a clever mother would always put the youngster into a very thick habitat where the environment itself would play the role than the leopard doing uh, or protecting the youngster. The environment sometimes do play the role. Like here, you can see the environment, the termite mud is playing a role for the hyenas in order to take care of the youngster and reach up to adulthood. They use the termite mud all the time. If there's a species that can be like impala where the youngster doesn't then, it's always art. It's more highly to lose that uh, particular youngster because all the time hyena, leopards, lions, they're out here looking for food and that it will be able to get hunted easily. If anything comes here in this kind of form or the structure, how the hyena have put this youngster in, these hyena here, they're going to signal the rest of the family of the clan and fight back the, uh, anything that comes into the dam. But uh, also lions, leopard, respect these uh, hyena den just because of the know that uh, hyena can really be so much protective when it comes to that den in, in most cases. It's unbelievable to see all of that um, information how hyena does. We'll take this opportunity and uh, over to Cedric who is doing some bedding. Yes, so uh, we definitely got a beautiful red billed hornbill that is hopping and bouncing along the road here on Panglin Road. As you can see, it's got that beautiful red beak, smaller than the uh, southern yellow billed hornbill, uh, but very, it looks very similar. And of course, his beak looks like a little chili. We always said I say a chili beak, like a red chili. But um, and talking about uh, hornbills and talking about symbiotic relationships, a very fascinating relationship here is between the hornbill and uh, the millipede, also known as the shongololo. So many times you'll find if a hornbill is nesting in one of those dead trees, the female will take all of, pluck all her feathers out and lay it out as, uh, as a nesting material inside of a dead tree, like a hollowed out tree. And then, of course, uh, what the male will do, he'll bring a little bit of uh, dead matter, like the, uh, dead uh, leaf uh, matter and all that, and he'll bring it into the uh, nest as well. So there's a little bit of dead matter with her feathers. And then he'll close up, the male will close up the, 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 the hole with um, some mud, leaving a little slit open. And what he'll do, he'll go grab a millipede, a shongololo, 
And because the Shongololo has, uh, secretes a certain toxi toxin, um, pretty much known as a cyanide, and what he'll do, he'll take that Shongololo and he'll poke it into the nest with the female. So when she's busy incubating the eggs and once the little chicks are have hatched and they're still young, uh, that Shongololo will be eating on that dead matter, on the dead leaf matter around the nesting area inside, of course, the nest. And uh, while he's doing that, they also secrete the toxins and it actually kind of creates uh, a, a non-parasitic uh, environment for the little chicks, for the hornbill chicks. So, of course, the Shungalolo is eating from them. Of course, he gets fed and he's helping the chicks and the hornbills staying away from parasites. And here he runs away. Find a way into, into the kill to eat, get their fill in there as well. They're also going to be told off. See, it's lions are not great at sharing their food. Okay, guys. Let me just take in frustration out on the other lion, but you see, it was interesting. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then or the leopard might have caught the impala and as it was dragging it the wild dog sword started chasing the leopard up into the tree and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. Now that elephant dung, see sometimes there's little insects and seeds and that inside there, that's it. And knock it open a bit. There we go. See exactly just knocking it open. Looking for any little bit of food that it can grab out of there. Because there's so many different things inside of an elephant dung. There we go, little seeds. And of course little grubs as well. That is so nice, it's so precious. Is he? Yes, good. Good afternoon. Definitely, they've got like a little bounce. Almost like a, a hop, skip and a jump uh, walk. I love it as well, Easy. It is really nice. But thank you very much for joining us on this World Environmental Day today, a very important day for the environment, for nature. But yes, thank you for the comment. All right. Oh, it looks like well, he's still busy there. Sorry, I don't want to go and interrupt him while he's enjoying whatever he's picking up there at the moment. Looks like there's some uh, where he is now. I can't go too much forward because they'll chase him away. Well, no, he's up, skipping a jump away from him. Come on, Rusty. Well, Rusty doesn't. Rusty's like, mm -hmm, come on, girl. You can do it. You can do it. I'm actually, I'm, I'm loving this. Uh, it's actually a nice, uh, pleasant weather this afternoon. I think it's a, it's a weather that we can definitely enjoy around here. And uh, especially for winter time. I mean, it's, I can actually really turn, take my sleeves and pull my sleeves back. That's a lovely, a lovely day here today. Well, tomorrow I am going to be heading to the Western Cape again. So I am heading to a very cold area of South Africa and very rainy and uh, and windy part of South Africa for win winter. I am looking forward to it, definitely. I think I'm just going to definitely have that uh, cup of hot chocolate and every night and every morning while I'm lying in bed. I'm like, yes, yes indeed. But I'm going to miss this weather. This is... Uh, Weather to enjoy every day, any day, yeah, in the low felt. Even though I have cloud cover, it's still nice. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. 
This year, we'll be heading to Bourgeois Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. All right, so I'll continue looking for Tlalamba if I can get any fresher tracks around here for her and the cubs. I'll definitely going to try and continue following up here. But while we're doing that, let's head over to Rexon and see what's he up to on his safari. Welcome back. Uh, we are right at quarantine. The world's uh, environment day. Let me find a very good spot here where we need to share about the beautiful uh, tree and the termite mount here. The symbiotic relationship between termites and the uh, trees around in the area. I'll take an example with the beautiful tree next to us here where we can also see the gnus that are coming from the distance it look like first time seeing them maybe they come in numbers only one guinea if we look at the um the tree here the base of the termite mount yeah, we we all worried about uh, elephant population and the debucking of the trees around in the area the relationship uh, between elephants and other species in the area or the symbiotic relationship is very high in the surrounding Take a look right here. This is the tree that pushed by elephant. It was the uh, one of the biggest tree around in the area, but surprisingly, you can see what happened there. Let me really take a look and go close, then I can able to um, pinpoint, but it's fine even from the distance. What happened here? Nothing wasted out in the bush. Even if we see elephant debucking, pushing trees around in the area. That tells you that um, the wood termite mount, it will take over and eat all this and decompose back into the soil system. The wood termite mount at the moment, they will not take over, they will cover all this tree one day. Slowly but sure, you know that sometimes a wood termite mount, or termite, they can be active and move out and come back. But with the wood termite mount, wherever is food, it becomes home in most cases in the environment. And why is we have such a, a, a behavior of an elephant that pushes trees, a big trees like this? Sometimes the elephant is really encouraged by the uh, tunnels around in the area to push trees down in order to go for the top leaves. Sometimes it's negative. It's all about nature. Elephant will try to create homes for other species. Of course, if you look at the all creatures that are really were snakes, of course, that have to um, go down in winter and try to uh, rest the rest of the winter time. They use trees, three holes inside that they have pushed by elephant. Look at the vultures, guys, quite a lot of vultures. They cannot patch on the trees that are still uh, having leaves. They need a dead tree, of course, in order to patch. We have geckos. It's quite a lot of things that I can mention that can utilize any trees that push by elephant. This is in the nature. It's nothing that we can do. Elephant, um, it really do their business. Some, some of the area where we realize nature is very sensitive. Elephant in some of the area, they push trees knowing that in the next two, two years, it will be erosion in that particular area. Some of the area we put Uh, most of the animals, they use termite as a benefit, you know. Remember, around the termite month, is always healthy grass. If they don't utilize living inside, they'll use termite month as uh, really graze around the termite month. But that can utilize termite month living inside snakes, uh, 
we have leopard tortoise, mangoes, civet, leopard, and uh, hyenas, warthogs, wild dogs to den inside, snakes, lots of squirrel, mangoes, all of those kind of small animals that need to dwell inside the termite mud. And remember, what might courage the termites to build the mount in the area? Without all this uh, dead material out in the bush, there's nothing that can take place because most of the termite mud that are very quick to build. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a dica carcass and a water buck. Oh. It's not as graceful as <laughs> he's a bit hesitant because well climbing a tree is not the easiest but he will get up there eventually so let's see there he goes and look at the power in that that is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there how cool is this i don't know how he's gonna do it but let's see See, the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go, nearly got him. Oh, beautiful, beautiful sunset, as you can see there, through the trees around in the area. Unbelievable, look at the golden car light. This is the perfect, uh, perfect uh, daylight. Look at all this uh, termite that I uh, had showing you that this is encouraged by the trees that have been pushed down and by elephant. Of course, remember, there's a lot of things that uh, really takes place. If you look at the symbiotic relationship between different sort of species that in nature, look at the history, the ancient people that used to rely on recycling of nature out in the bush. People, they never use anything a part of bush material to do anything out in the bush. Even burial, it used, they use logs, they use all grasses in order to encourage the recycling of nature. You know, what we see here, in most cases is recycling of nature. For me, in terms of uh, terrorism or in environment, I don't see destruction. I see here uh, recreation of nature, which everything back into life. The, I mean, the soil that here yeah, is going to be decomp or fertile, decompose all these things, it back into soil system. Remember, if elephant doesn't do all of this, defecate, eat, push, these kind of assault it will need. Let's take this opportunity from the quarantine back to Cedric looking for Kalamba. Definitely, definitely, Rexon. I agree with you 100%. Uh, I don't see destruction, I see creation. And uh, I think without these dead trees standing upright like this one in front of me, and the ones that's lying down all over the show, um, I don't think uh, there would be certain species around there. I think a l actually lots of species wouldn't be here uh, because one thing will lead to the next thing. Wood boring beetles will be here uh, and if those trees aren't around then that uh, certain beetle species won't be around to actually feed a certain bird species. Uh, it is one, it's a whole life cycle, you know, the whole cycle of things around here. So you need to, need to start off with a certain uh, thing to really create uh, more that comes above it, pretty much like a pyramid. So yes, it's very, very important. That's why I always also feel that uh, uh, soil, soil's got such a high value to the to the ecosystem as well and to the cycle of life around here. Uh, certain soil species will, of course, uh, or certain tree species use only certain soil species, species, same as grass species as well. They'll only grow around certain soil areas and um, Without that, of course, uh, with a certain grass growing around there, then you'll have your herbivores growing there, your zebra, your wildebeest, your buffalo. And of course, with that, for them being around there, then you'll have your predators, of course, your lions and your leopards and uh, all those uh, bigger predators around. So there's quite a cycle to it. Eventually they, eventually they die 
and they decompose and they form part of the soil again and the whole cycle starts all over again. So it's very important, I think, the ecosystem and, uh, and the cycle of life. Oh, okay, we've got a, we got a, we got a roadblock here. Ooh. Hyena and hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Maybe hippo jaws gaping. It's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of Explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm. Head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. And the um, thing about it, so we're talking about symbiotic relationships. One of the nicest uh, um, symbiotic relationship I enjoy is uh, one called a host parasitism. A host, parasit a host parasitism uh, symbiotic relationship is very interesting. And there's a bird, the cuckoos. They are specialists at actually using other birds as hosts. So they will kind of make sure they're looking at the other birds' movements from the nest back and forth, back and forth. And sometimes you'll find that the cuckoo will quickly fly to that nest to investigate the colors, uh, the color of the eggs of their host. And then of course that uh, cuckoo will actually then lay her eggs, yeah. almost, getting the, almost getting the same coloration of eggs. And so of course the host bird will not recognize that there is an extra egg or two that's in the nest. And when they do hatch, you'll find that the host bird um, will be feeding its chicks, but then the parasitism bird, the cuckoo, the gape, the mouth at the side, so it's exact the same coloration and inside the mouth as the host's uh, chicks. So she will not know which one is her own chicks and she'll just feed all of them thinking all of them are her ch uh, chicks and uh, bringing up the cuckoo into adulthood and sometimes the cuckoo can be two, three times larger than the host bird it's, itself. So that's what we call a host parasitism where uh, one species benefits, of course the cuckoo benefits, and the other species does not benefit at all. It actually makes it a little bit worse because their own chicks actually sometimes get thrown out the nests because the chicks of the parasitism bird is larger than the host itself. So yes, host parasitism, <clears throat> very, very uh, nice symbiotic uh, relationship there. Um, but uh, it is, of course, unfortunately, a bit of a negative effect to the one. Anyway, while I'm still looking around, I've, I've gone a little bit further east, I don't know why. Well, I've gone a little bit further east. I know that Lama, I think she's gone more west from uh, Molawati, not east. But I'm uh, just coming to you just to cancel uh, certain areas off and maybe I might have missed a track or two coming this side, but I don't think so. I think she's still west of Molawati. But uh, yes, while we continue uh, east, yeah, let's head over to Rexon while he's at Gurry Dam. Welcome back from Sadiq. Look at the beautiful golden uh, colors uh, for the afternoon. Of course, it looked like building up clouds. It looked like uh, maybe in the morning it might be, or tomorrow it might be raining around the area. It's really intimidating if you look at the weather to the um, uh, south of us because our rainfall comes from Mozambique and Bangara current that comes from the uh, south to the north. Uh, look at the beautiful African sunset. Unbelievable. Would love to see this, um, especially if a leopard is up in a tree and you take this beautiful shot of uh, leopard um, and also this golden light behind. We are at Gary Dam. 
at the moment and looking around here yeah, and enjoying the sun at the same time let's all of us enjoy the sunset of course take many pictures and self we are in africa of course this is our daily life we are in a paradise here in africa witnessing golden light like this now pollution around in the area as reason you see a beautiful beautiful sunset we have a lot of the uh, folk tale, uh, folk tale drongo that comes in and out here, trying to really benefit from the vehicle. If you do move, unfortunately, we're not moving. It's used to most most of the time. We tend to see these um, species following breeding herd of uh, different species around in the area, as far as impala, kudu, uh, elephant, buffalo. They benefit a lot with that um, uh, and really disturbing the species that uh, really benefit out of them. As they move, they will pick insect, which is unbelievable. We have the water source here, water hole, Gary Dam, which we have a lovely, lovely scene. We tend to see at the dam itself, look at the reflection from the uh, sunset is that is stunning. Beautiful, beautiful. I wish to have a boat and uh, really for her to take me uh, a shot uh, in the middle of the water, the way it's most golden light. It will be solid and beautiful. It's magic. Today, look at the water hole. There's no hippo, but you can tell there's no doubt. Mishka, you're seeing something that you uh, never get old. Uh, one scene. One. Oh, yes. Scene. Unbelievable. Yes, of course. It stays uh, young, it stays shining, it stays always beautiful. Of course, if you look at the waterhole, there's no doubt here. If you are a naturist coming to the area, you will tell that uh, hippo can dwell in the surrounding. What you can really figure out in most cases, there is no way, and let me guarantee, in all these water sources, if you find water lilies, it means there's an animal that lives inside the water that comes from one part to another. What might be? It could be, of course, hippo. It could be, of course, the guinea fowl. In most cases, I mean, not guinea fowl, the Egyptian geese, spare wings, and all that. Because when they land from one side to another, they can really take seeds, they can take roots, they can take even uh, a string. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens. Each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. We want to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! That hippo, some of the aquatic species that lives in the water, they cannot lay eggs because, of course, the transport of water lilies is on the hippo. So how important hippo to the other species that lives inside water, as far as, as African jacana, as far as fish. Let's take this opportunity, or what you said, the is enjoying the sunset at the same time. Yes, it is a beautiful, magnific sunset this afternoon here on our Sunset Drive. As you can see, that sunset is really stunning. The colors are amazing. And uh, I love always a dead tree involved with the sunset. I think it always gives such a beautiful setting to the entire uh, picture. But 
can see, you can even see that sun setting. You can even see it moving down when it gets to the horizon. And that orange color is really coming through. But uh, I'm definitely just going to take a couple of seconds in here and just uh, really admire this moment on World Environment Day. And hopefully with this beautiful sunset uh, this afternoon, we can get a beautiful sighting of uh, one of our characters, maybe old Columba and the Cubs. I'm really holding thumbs for that. Apparently, I just got an update about her now that uh, she went into Torchwood this morning. So I'm completely off track. I thought she was more on the western side of Molawati, but apparently she was on the into Torchwood, that's east, so that's exactly where I am. I'm on the eastern side now, so maybe my gut feeling was correct. Uh, I am going to do a, the cheetah cut line uh, not too long from now, just to follow up. Chantal, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on our Sunset Drive and on World Environment Day. Um, what will happen to Columbus Cubs if Molawati bumps into them? No, not much, uh, Chantal. Um, Molawati is the father of uh, Columbus Cubs and they have been seen together a few times and I'm sure more times than we actually believe because some nights we don't, we're not there and I'm sure they have, uh, you know, they bump into each other. And I'm sure that, uh, yeah, I'm sure they will be very happy to see their fathers or their, their father come again. And uh, I'm sure they always get excited when they see Mulawati. But it'll be very nice to see the, the four of them all together. And that happened maybe, what, two months ago when they had that kill in the tree. So if it was another, if Mulawati was not the father of those cubs, I mean, on that day already, I think uh, he would have killed the cubs. It's called um, infant side. So infant side is a very common thing that happens with lions and leopards. If it's not their offspring, they will kill the other male's offspring just to get the female into estrus as quick as possible so they can spread their genes. I don't know why I'm talking so soft and with this uh, real kind of wavy voice, but I think it's because of this beautiful sunset and the colors. As our global Wild Earth family grows, we know that many of you struggle to get your questions answered during the live safari. Going forward, we will be holding AMAs for our Wild Earth explorers on a regular basis. The first is with our resident leopard whisperer, Tristan Dix. Join me for an AMA on the 8th of June, straight after the Sunset Safari. This will be your chance to ask me anything you like. All you have to do is sign up to be an explorer, and you can meet me here on Juma with your questions ready. To celebrate World Oceans Day and create awareness for the role that the oceans play in everyday life, Wild Earth has some brand new Dive Live merchandise in our shop. T-shirts, sweatshirts, bags and even caps. So take the plunge, head over to our shop and see what you can find. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. Uh, uh, afternoon, baby Aina. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, yes, I uh, wish you could teleport here. It is really stunning, uh, baby Aina. But um, I really feel really privileged to uh, show you these beautiful images and uh, and that all of us today can 
and can enjoy it, and especially that it is World Environment Day. Um, we can really take in on what we've got and how precious our Earth is to us. As I say, there's only one Earth, and we need to look after it. But maybe teleporting will be a thing one day, you never know. Junkyard Gamer, good afternoon. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us on <laughs> Sunset Safari. Are we in the dry season? That's correct, Junkyard Gamer. We are in the... Uh, we're in a dry season, but we had very late rains. Uh, we, our rains will usually stop around about April, maybe a little bit of May, but we had so much rain in May uh, that it uh, caused uh, the bush to be still so green and still, still so lush and wet. Uh, so we definitely had our late rains. But uh, this is supposed to be our dry season, and it'll be dry right up to about September August, September, then we'll start slowly but surely getting our first little bit of rain coming through uh, when we start entering our summer period again. I know in the Western Cape, it's pretty much opposite. I know the Western Cape, they get their summer, uh, there's no rain, and in winter, they get their rainfall in winter time. So uh, I'm sure I'm heading into rain very soon. Lovely. That is, it's one big torch light. But you never know, maybe I will go and join and pop up there again at uh, Penguin Beach again. You never know, maybe I'll just uh, show my face that side. I'll see. <laughs> I do love those penguins, they are very cute. Uh, very, very sweet that side. But I know Betty's Bay does get cold. Anyway, while we enjoy the last bit of sunset, let's head back to Rexon and see how his safari is going. We are heading uh, slowly to the west. We just passed uh, the uh, Galakopan. There was a report uh, a little bit of west of here of uh, Tavangume. Looked like uh, his tracks coming from the north uh, or from Ops Road. Would like to uh, go and investigate the area. Maybe we might be lucky. Who knows? It's been a long time I've been seeing Tavangume. I was lucky this uh, morning seeing Shasha and Langa was the best uh, sighting of those two uh, over many months for me not to see them around. I believe all oh, the leopards are back in the area and the lions are back in the area. It's the right time of the season, of course. Uh, just asking guys from the, the south, it looks like uh, there's a four male coalition down from the south that are pushing Kuhumas, which means Kuhumas is going to settle back into the origin habitant uh, territory, which is right here, and back into Befeswick. It looks like they're all going to be back around and they'll stay longer. You never know what's going to happen with the, the four individual uh, dominant males that are coming from the south. Maybe they'll push over to the side. Especially if they're born in the area of the south, Mala Mala, they might be really try to come more towards our area. But if they're further more from the south, they might be interested to settle. We only have one Earth. This phrase highlights the challenges of collective action between nations. It emphasizes the great test of our time. Achieving environmental change cannot be met by countries acting alone. 
Head over to the Wild Earth Shop to buy your only One Earth merchandise and create awareness for global change this World Environment Day. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. I'll be glad if I can see a uh, full collection of miles to come into this area and conquer. The only thing that will be sad because when the four male gets into this area, if they find the females with the cubs, they're going to kill the cubs and force the female to be an hostage that they can mate with the female in order to take care of their own offspring. But of course, there's a huge benefit having four males, you know, guarantee that you'll be always seeing lions in your area because being four, the unbeatable, of course, they can challenge whoever needs to come around in the area. I will take this road uh, called Power Line. The tracks look like uh, the guys spotted the tracks crossing maybe towards uh, Viatella axis to the south. If it was uh, Tavangume, Oh, not yes, of course, uh, if we find the tracks of this big, uh, beautiful cat, uh, why not, we'll be able to really follow up and find him. I know that uh, in many cases, if he comes in the area, he likes to cross here and hunt in the area a lot. If we're not finding his tracks, we'll be able to go back from where Hart and uh, Cedric have spotted the tracks in order to follow up. Look like it's gonna be a little bit of drizzling here. I don't know, I'm not sure whether it's the beginning of the rain. It's very heavy cloud through from the south, of course. It might be raining further more south, but it could be just a cloud that uh, really is gonna give us like one or two minutes and uh, move out or burn out. In the, uh, let us check uh, power line. If we not. We will go back towards Vietnam axis. Of course, there's a leopard that moves all the time here. And I doubt uh, we have seen the tracks yesterday. We follow up and cross over into Befesuk. And in the morning, it was back in the same area. It looked like Tawangume is more like strengthening in this area at the moment. Try to conquer the area and contest the area from any male that comes around in this particular area. A dominant male leopard, uh, if the all three, it will be nice. If Tavangume is sadly here and um, the uh, turtle span is sadly to the south and we have a uh, skittish male leopard that stays in Mulawati uh, to the east, it will be the best. Uh, at the moment, I'm just fearing with the cubs from Kalamba that Mulawati has to hold a turtle very strong to defend those cubs in order to reach the adulthood. Painted hoof, your cousin, yes, they did uh, long ago. Uh, Looked like uh, they were more into the eastern part. And they have used quite a lot of den uh, many years back uh, in, in the area of Juma. Because obviously where we are at the moment, yes, they have used quite a lot of few areas. And just because of the environment here in the area, it's not in the favor of the wild dogs. It's in the favor of uh, hyenas. And just because also, remember, permanent um, uh, uh, clan that uh, we have in the area, they have stayed longer in this property. It means that uh, the wild dogs have to shift away with less competition, of course, as far as further more is. But it did happen before, before this clan, uh, clan of hyena get into the number that is shocking at the moment. Yes, but at the moment I doubt they cannot dine in the area. It's a huge competition, of course, from the uh, he and the wild dogs, they will be always interacting. And the wild dogs they don't like that in most cases. They tend to be dining in an area where it's less noise and less competition from the predator. 
nine after that they compete the closest area that i've seen is around Manyeleti boundary which is not far from us here less than three kilometers to the north so slowly by sure you can see that um, they can slowly come back in the surrounding but uh, remember in service and jejuma wildlife safari life area or the conservancy we have high density of uh, uh, hyenas and the leopards so wilder will always avoid that If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. Are you a fan of the Juma clan? If the answer to this is yes, then you are cordially invited to our Hyena Halabaloo starting on the 13th of June. During this week, we want to take a trip down memory lane. Please send in your favorite Juma clan moments to hyena at wildearth.tv by the 7th of June and we will dig into our archives and try our hardest to play it out during this week of Hyena celebrations. I'm really amazing here because it looks like the uh, male impala is still uh, very hot here, steaming here, try to do the right thing. It could be uh, late pickers of the female, but this time of the year, some of the female may be already 80% of them now are pregnant. So you might find that the dominant male that uh, used to be with this impala have collapsed and he take over and try to save his the rest of the female that are left behind. It's in the nature of impala, especially a dominant male. They are species that will challenge, and all the time they wait outside the, um, on the outskirts of a male that is mating, waiting for him to really lose condition and they can challenge. Uh, it, it's like that, it's common. Even lions, human beings, everyone are like that. He's look like a stronger male. He's going to really, um, uh, find the other female at the other side of the road and push them together. But if he doesn't do that quite a lot, he might be uh, spotted by the males that are waiting for him to lose. Maybe it might be 20 or less than female to get mate. If he is weak, you know, survival of the fetus out in nature. The stronger male that is stronger, he, stronger than him, he will come and push him off and mate with the female. It's in nature, you find sometimes impala in the late season of breeding around January, February, and give birth. You cannot get surprised with that. Sometimes are the late pickers amongst the females. Those who are really, wow, well, it's a busy boy. Is, is really at, uh, making sure all these female, all these giraffe, also moving here, moving, making all these female move into one point. The giraffe is moving away. This is a different call. This is more like a lamb call. It's not all the, the writing season. We we'll wait here. You heard that? Mm. We're in the right area now. This is the liming, it's not the writing. We just want to establish the right direction of where we might be looking. Unfortunately, with this uh, vehicle, we cannot off-road at the moment. 
due to the uh, technical problem of uh, Wendy, it's uh, really not in a good status to off-road in the area, but it could be something here. We'll, we'll, we'll drive around and come back in the same area and check if we might uh, able to spot something, but definitely that is a lamp hole and also the Foktel Drango is just telling us more or less is where the area guys have seen the Tawangume tracks cross heading into the block here. So it could be something not far from the area. We'll able to uh, really drive forward and come back in the same area. If it's a leopard, it might be walking on the road. Let's take this opportunity over to Cedric. Yes, um, yeah, on Ledwood Road. I'm actually trying to follow up on Lunga and Sasha now because um, I know Rexon's around there at Gary Dam. I think I think Gary Dam, and uh, hopefully they can uh, find whatever those pilots are alarm calling for. But apparently yeah, it's some um, rain there, so I decided to get myself my uh, uh, myself a cluster leaf umbrella. So I'm gonna, in case it starts raining, then I've got uh, some protection here. Yeah? So it's, it's a bit of uh, an interesting. How can I say, sporadic rain that came through, weird, but it's fine. I've got these, we've got these. There's so many little of, uh, umbrellas around there that we can use. Uh, I think Panda and myself will, if it starts raining, we'll definitely kit ourselves up with a whole lot of these cluster leaves and uh, make sure that we don't get too wet. But I don't think it looks, it is rainy clouds that's coming through. It is quite dark, but... Uh, uh, I think it'll be pushing through very quickly. I don't think it'll be anything too serious for this afternoon. And anyway, we are going to come there left at uh, uh, Langa and um, Sasha in this block here. So, and they said they were coming north this morning. So I'm just on Ledwood Road. And it's going to be interesting times to see. I'm sure, I don't know yet, but I wonder if Langa and uh, Tlalamba have bumped into each other. I wonder if that's... Uh, that scenario has played out yet because uh, it is two females. Lunga is busy setting up her territory at the moment, just south from where we are now, the southern side of Juma, into Little Gauri, um, into a little bit of Chitwa, Little Gauri vessels area. And of course, the Tlalamba is pretty much set her area in Juma itself, and as well coming right to the southern side of Juma. So there is that overlap in this area that we are in at this present time. So what, uh, it's going to be quite interesting once uh, those two females do bump into each other. I think uh, it's going to be see what's going to happen then. On top of that, well, we are continuing down Ledwood Road to see if any, uh, any signs of the two of them. Let's head over to Taylor in Pridelands. She's got some elephants. we managed to find an animal today <laughs> one with four legs and actually moving not just remnants of it like all the arthropods that we found today and I suppose it's also because the wind has stopped but here we are watching a group of male elephants have a drink at one of the reservoirs so Pridelands doesn't actually have any pumped water on it other than this little pan over here um, remember Pridelands has obviously come an incredibly long way uh, from what it used to be for 60 years and now we have all of the animals that roam around in South Africa roaming around here really but unfortunately there's still a couple of these concrete uh, water containers if you really want to call them that we call them reservoirs so they've decided now during the dry seasons that they will definitely keep pumping water and just allow for some some fresh water to be available and you can only imagine how the elephants will really travel far and wide to come and drink the freshest of fresh water. So I've heard it's, it's actually quite interesting how none of the none of the breeding herds have come back. It seems as though just the just the bulls are really lingering around. This is amazing, and now she's headed towards the elephants. Yeah, here comes the male behind us. This is the male lion coming over here. He's got the 
elephants have huddled up to protect the young ones in the middle and he's going after that girl and they are the buffalo going after the lion and the lioness they're still going after them look at that guy charging hey Lauren, as your underwater biologist. We have a turtle! So this is the dive symbol for a turtle. So today is not any ordinary day, it is World Ocean Day. This is, you know, those kinds of things. I can kind of go, can kind of go wild. <laughs> Ah, now I believe that all of you are wondering if I know anything about Susan has been around. I have unfortunately not been on Prideland since January. So she's obviously part of the breeding herds that haven't been uh, frequenting this area. What, what kind of happened with Pridelands in case you are, and maybe you, but I shall repeat it anyways, is that Pridelands had a fence around it for pretty much the last 60 years or so. So elephants were never really allowed to come through here. It obviously limits the movements of the big cats, but something like leopard and the smaller cat species, it's very difficult to stop their movements. But the elephants kind of kept away. And the day that they dropped half of the fence line, the elephants came back within a few days later. And then eventually they dropped the entire fence line other than just the uh, southwestern that goes into town as much as I'd love to see elephants at the shopping center I don't think that it's ideal <laughs> you know for the safety of the people so we have that fence line up there but all the breeding herds came through to this area because it hadn't been browsed and grazed upon so you can imagine it was it was amazing and we unfortunately as humans we've stopped the natural migratory routes of these animals so they're quite restricted as to why they go which is often why we end up calling them is because they aren't able to travel huge distances and find new feeding grounds as uh, frequently as they'd like and they constantly have to keep returning. So Susan was one of those herds and it's it's not very common that you know you would see the same herd of or herds of elephants every single day for months. I mean I think it was a year that the same groups of elephants kept coming back every single day. It was phenomenal. I personally have never seen anything like that before and I find myself quite lucky particular herd so well because we get to know the bull um, uh, more often rather than you know the cows and the individuals obviously there's a few cows that we know here and there like fang is another we see, is seen in the sabi sand and she roams uh, in the southern sections and heads up north and she probably pops her head into other places too with, with her entire herd so i'm not sure um i mean they could be in some of the neighboring reserves well I'm here for a little while, so hopefully I'll be able to meet up with Susan at some point. Off you go to Cedric, he's also got these gentle giants. Yes, so look at that. So we are, <laughs> we've got some attitude from a little elephant. Hello, yes. Oh, and the one at the back. Of course, mom is behind. Yes, yes. I'm gonna, what are you going to do? And you're so cute. Yes, look at you. Your ears. Oh, it's so beautiful. I love them like that. Ears that's flaring up like that. <laughs> it, is, it is so adorable. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it is so adorable. I love it. I think they are the most uh, cutest little things when they throw that attitude and those personalities come through and showing that they are so big, but in fact, they are so small. And of course they're thinking, yeah, but I've got mom's backing and aunt's backing and don't you mess with me kind of attitude. I love it. Very cute. And mom's just like, uh, them mothers just continue eating, is not uh, not phased about anything. So I love it. Fantastic animals. I think it is one of our species that we really need to look up. <laughs> Here he comes through, the little one comes out again. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> The sniffing. One of the species we really have to look after, and I've got such a soft spot for them. Um, because so they are so clever, intelligent animals, and uh, they respect one another as a herd, as herd members. And I just love that. Hello, Mom. Hello, Mom. Yes. 
And we're just sitting and enjoying your family. Hmm? Hello everyone from sunny Namibia. My name is Cameron Pierce and this year I'll be representing Ongava Game Reserve at the Safari Guide of the Year 2022 edition. You know, a lot of people have asked me what it would be like to win the competition and it would obviously be an incredible privilege, but uh, even just to be selected as one of the five finalists is an honor that I, I never expected and special to be a part of it for this year. My name is Liam Henderson. I'm a guide at the Homestead Lodge on Nambiti Private Game Reserve in KwaZulu Natal. I think Safari Guide of the Year is a great competition to be a part of. I'm somewhat nervous for the tracking part of the competition, as being in KZN now, uh, I've been haven't been exposed to the low felt animals and tracks and signs that are so apparent up there. Nice, so we got uh, this beautiful female that's right next to us, of course, just eating, minding her own business, and, uh, and she's right next to the vehicle. Hey, girl. Yes, you are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Not the oldest of females, maybe about, I'd say, 30 years old. I'm not really that old. Blue Wax Bull, yes, good afternoon. It is uh, definitely always a special sighting for me as well. And there's little ones going down into the ground, yeah. Uh, but it's always very special. It's just so nice to, to sit and watch them and uh, watch them go about their, their daily routine. And especially when it comes to these little ones. Watch this little one now. Watch his head up. She's going to try and catch up to mom. Which is, I think he's like, hey, mom, wait. Oh, he's taking the long road round. All right, you can take that ride. No, it's fine. Be like that. You don't want to play with us. Fine. But yes, Blue Wax Ball, it is. It's always a special sighting. And yes, it is a special day for special sightings. As quick as these elephants came into picture, as quick as they pretty much almost moved out of picture. Yeah, white man, good afternoon. Yes, definitely the curiosity and cheekiness of these little calves are just, it's just magical. It's, it's brilliant. I think it's moments like that where I just laugh inside internally. I like I get warm and I like I, and I mean laughter. That's that's how much I love it. It's just so so adorable. <laughs> yeah, no, what man it is. Very privileged to witness this like this every day. Really am. Really am privileged to do that. But I think as quick as they are as quick as they have come, they are definitely vanishing away into the thickets there. We're gonna let them be and we're gonna continue down Ledwood Road and Continue seeing if we are lucky with Lungo or Sasha further on. Maybe they did move a little bit further west from where we are now. So I'm gonna hold thumbs up. I'm gonna put my, and my light is on. There we go. And amazing, I can't believe, sorry, I forgot about that. Can't believe I heard as well that uh, Rexon had uh, and Bele's two little cubs out. That is fantastic. I, I'm like, once again, I'm like, I haven't seen those two little cubs yet. Um, I saw in Bele there, of course, for the last two days, but I haven't seen the cubs, physically seen the cubs. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll have to wait till I get back to uh, see them. So, yeah. I'll, Looking forward to that, but uh, for now, I'm sure everybody will enjoy them and I'll keep a close eye on the screen as well. Anyway, while well, we continue down Ledwood Road, let's head over to Rexon and while he's searching for his predator. So we're 
just, well, sorry about that. We're coming back to me again. And, uh, well, definitely I'm going to find that uh, cat for you guys. I'm hoping so. Let's uh, continue the search. Let's continue the search. And I'm hoping uh, towards Twin Dams, head to Twin Dams. Maybe I'll find another three eggs there. I might be lucky. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, let's head towards that area and uh, uh, there's a beautiful evening. I'm hoping that we find those leopards around that side. Uh, Jane, uh, how do leopards choose their territory? You know, Jane, first let's come out to a female leopard. A female leopard well, not really. It'll choose a territory, but it usually kind of won't venture too far from mom's territory. So usually that uh, the mother will break off a little piece of a territory uh, for a daughter to start off with, but it'll be small. And you'll start seeing that her territory will start expanding, 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 especially if there's no other females to the other sides of her area. Um, so she'll start looking at that. So it depends on what, uh, how much pressure there is from other females. So sometimes it also depends on... Uh, uh, the area, the, the you know, the area that they end. I mean, if you're looking at a drainage line, a beautiful drainage lines like uh, the Sand River or the Sabi River, Olifants River, you'll find there's a lot more pressure on female on, on territories itself there due to the fact of uh, those drainage lines is perfect habitat for uh, leopards and of course a lot of game that does come around to those areas. Uh, where male. They'll get pushed out and they'll become nomadic for maybe two years from when they get pushed out of their area, from their father's area, from father's territory. They can venture very, very far. So I thought it was a snake. Uh, venture very far and eventually they might find a little void, a little area that they think they can maybe take over. Maybe they see the male in that territory is an old male, is struggling to keep that area and maybe challenge him and, uh, you know and try and take over from another male, so that also does happen. So, but they all always start small, and then they start expanding. Because one, once they start, when they, once they find their territory, they're not full grown, they're not fully grown, like the males, even the females, they're not fully grown yet. They still got a, like maybe another 10, 15 kgs to pick up on their weight before they start. But yes. That's, that's, yeah, no, that's always one of those ways, but it's always interesting and I mean I've seen males come into this area, same as Tingana, he started off small, he just really had Arethus and had so much pressure from M. Sakhwen, from Mvula this side, um, he had a lot of pressure from different leopards in this area. Um, I'm not too sure on the western side of Arethus, I can't remember if there were, which male was, was there. <laughs> yeah. But uh, he started off small and then, of course, just expanded. So, yes, we'll start realizing what he needs to do, who he needs to compete against, size up his opponents. My name is Nico Britz. I am originally from Cape Town. I worked in the Eastern Cape for about nine years before I started working at Bushwise Field Guides in the Low Felt, uh, close to Makalali Private Game Reserve. So I'm hoping that by doing this, this could inspire the younger or newer guides coming into the industry to do the same. Hello everyone, my name is Ruan Groble. I'm from Lion Sands Game Reserve and being nominated for the Safari Guide of the Year came as somewhat of a surprise to me. I was very excited and quite nervous as well in the beginning uh, to tackle this task. But it's, it's, it's quite a prestigious event and it, it means that you are recognized. And I'm quite happy to be recognized. It means quite a lot to me. Well, we continue down here. Let's head back to Rexon uh, on his bumble. Welcome back from Cedric. We are now Gary Bay Fishing Pond trying to check. On the tracks look like uh, Tawangume 
early in the morning, like like headed south. Maybe I believe he might be still walking around in the area. The best area to check. We'll head a little bit more to the east, but we know that Tavangume uh, base on the um, east of uh, the Ops Road, west of uh, Ops Road itself. He likes his area furthermore to the gate. But we have checked that the Impala was lambing, but you can see that uh, if it's any leopard off into the bush, we have no access today well, due to our vehicle. But uh, let's carry on and head straight to the east. There was a pride of lions that crossed into Bafesu. Who knows? Maybe they might come back. If it's Kuhuma pride, I don't believe that it can stay longer to the north without males. Unless if the males are involved, yes, they might stay a little bit longer. Crossing with the cubs, it could be a biggest, biggest mistake because there's S8 male that always operates in the north. If you come across with the pride, they might uh, really lose their offspring. So they has to really come back in the area and start to move back slowly uh, you know, conservancy to the south. Unless if the males are involved, they might be uh, really safe because they can stay with the male. S8 male is a, is a male that is, doesn't have collation. It's only one male dominant uh, with the breakaway from Telamati, which is not going to stand the ground against the two males, even though the blondie is not in a good condition but two against one, it cannot work at all. It's so much dangerous if you want to challenge two male being lonely. You cost yourself uh, danger, death, of course. Let's see, along this road maybe, you might be lucky. I'm very glad because uh, all these lions are now coming back. Humans are coming back, uh, at least a report of a uh, line every day. My name is Solomon Lobu. I am working at Singita Kruger National Park. I am very excited today to be one of the guys that have been nominated to select it to participate in the Safari Guide of the Year. I'm an activator. Uh, I like starting something, motivating others to become better. I am positive. You know, I like to um, focus on the positive sides of the situation. Again, let's uh, take our chances. Without taking chances, you would never uh, achieve. Maybe the lines might be back. Uh, the report of the lines crossing from Bevisuk uh, to the north. But if they engage anything, difficulties that might be quickly come back because it's due to pride that have youngster, as I was mentioning earlier on. So chances like that uh, sometimes work. If not, maybe early in the morning, they might be back in the surrounding because without the males, they cannot really enjoy their own lives being free hunting to the north. Although Kuhumas, they know this area very well. They uh, come from the, the north, of course. And uh, remember, Kuhuma is an old breakaway from Telamati. They know even Manyeleti furthermore to the north, even part of Befesuk. They've been here. Some of those cubs that are uh, sub or female that are having cubs at the moment, uh, the cubs that were born around in the area 2016, 2015, around Vietela. We have seen most of us, uh, those uh, pride, killing buffalo during the drought in front of Vietela camp itself in a daily basis. And some of the cubs remember very well north of uh, <clears throat> Vietela itself. We have witnessed when they have uh, a white muscle disease. Some of them, they were killed during that uh, with the disease. Some of them, they sustain. Of course, survival of the fetus, those sustain, they really, or those who survive, 
they were fit, they were very fit on the pride itself. They reach up to adulthood. As today, we've seen them having cubs. And now they're back into their roots. They know this area very well. And I believe that uh, we might uh, able to see them maybe tomorrow or this afternoon. Who knows? It was very sad to see a population of an lion wiped by the natural disease as a white muscle disease, myopath. That is the term of the disease of itself. It's a lot of disease, a lot more, lot more complex disease that might be in the area here and more for wildlife, of course. So that's the reason, if anything, uh, it's overpopulated in the area. Nature takes its own course. Buffalo get sick no much grass around and that affects the lion's population also buffalo population at the same time and all of them drop down which is that's very great this year we see all these animals have having a lot more grass very healthy it means all the lions and leopards that were born this year they will be a lot more stronger and healthy they're going to survive if there's no uh, interference with uh, other lions or leopards uh, again in the area killing one another. We might see a very good population of leopards and lions uh, next year. It's still early, six months to go if I'm not mistaken. Those cubs are born now, they're able to reach December, January next year. And for a leopard, it's a lot of cub, of course, with the talamba grass, very tall. Let's give more um, cover, of course, to go away from lions. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. I spotted Janet. You can see there. I don't know whether it'll hold. I wish for you guys to see a spotted Janet here. The We just spotted something small. One of the predators that we have in the area. Let me go slightly backwards, maybe. We might see, eh? And unfortunately, he hides in the tall grasses. That was a spotted giant. Very, very rare to see, especially early hours of the day like this. Sometimes in the middle of the night, yes, you tend to see them staying. They were able to uh, really pose in front of the uh, camera, but look like. Uh... Uh, let's take this opportunity over to Cedric. Yes, uh, oh, unfortunately, I thought uh, you would have been lucky with that, Janet. It would be nice. Um, well, uh, Rex is saying as well, I remember that as well. I was at in 20. And, um, I remember that drought that came through that time of the year. And um, it was very sad with all that, uh, of course, not much grass. The buffaloes lost, uh, lost a, like, uh, body condition. Yes, maybe lions were actually having a good time feeding, but 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, yeah, that white mus muscle disease did knock them quite badly, and that's for the Nkumas and the Sticks Pride. I remember, oh, little one, why do you keep on jumping in front of me? And the Sticks Pride as well, and it was really sad losing uh, so many little cubs at that time of the year. Of that time of the year, and. Um, so it just shows you sometimes you think that the predators are actually gaining and uh, easy pickings and all that. Yeah, it might be easy pickings, but scrub here. What are you doing? Stop jumping in front of me. Come, jump off. And um, yeah, sometimes it's like you think it's easy pickings for the predators, but it does, uh, it's quite detrimental to them at the end. Um, of course, not getting the right uh, protein out of the meat from the buffaloes due to the lack of grass. So yes, oh, there's two. There you go, follow your friend. Follow your friend, don't come back on the road. No, no, stay, stay, thank you. There we go, now listen to me. No. Good scrubbers, very good scrubbers. Sometimes they do listen, after a while. All right, coming up towards Treehouse Dam. Let's take a look at this. Because you know, ooh, what is that? Oh, no, that's a night job far down that side. If you are a wild earth explorer, we have exciting news for you. The winner of this month's prize giveaway will win a hamper full of explorer merchandise. Like this fantastic t-shirt that comes in plenty of great colors, a very useful tote bag, or even a cap. For those in the Southern Hemisphere that's heading into winter, a sweatshirt to keep you warm head over to the Wild Earth Explorers page. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could win all of these goodies. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. All things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful. Wild Earth will see it all. Each little flower that opens. Each river that does flow. Join us to celebrate World Environment Day for a very special safari show. Some widow birds. Yes, uh, we do. Uh, we do see the widow birds aside, definitely the little black ones. And of course, when they come into plumage. Um, so Rudy, yes. Oh, wait, there's a... Sorry. It's an owl. Is it? No. Sorry about that. I thought it was an owl. Uh, Rudy, yeah, uh, the indigo birds and all that. Are they indigo birds? The little widow birds? Is that indigo, widow? Not too sure what the hell. Sorry, I just missed that one. Oh, the widow bird. I think we do see the widow bird that side. I haven't seen one for a while this side. Uh, usually you'll find maybe there were some of the widow birds coming through in uh, summertime or beginning of summer, so September, October, in this area. But definitely, I haven't seen any in, the, in this area that we are now. Um, maybe the southern side of Kruger towards the Crocodile River. I'll have to look that up for you, but I'm not 100% on that. Do you see eyes there? Is it there? Oh, a little Maybe we also got a little genital. Is it here? We'll see. Oh no, it's a little scrubby. Those are the little orange eyes that come through here. Double check on that. Sorry, I don't look up. We had Treehouse Dam at the moment. I just want to see anything that's there. Ah, uh, nothing here. But I agree with uh, Rex and definitely go and take a look at the boundaries for those lines, those line tracks that came over from this afternoon. I'm just double checking a lot of eyes down that side. It's funny that I can see the eyes, but uh, Panda can't because it's just from my angle. Maybe if I do it from his angle. You see there? 
I don't know what it is. It could be a Janet that's running. Here you got it there. It's difficult to see. It's just at the base of that tree. It would be nice to see that. As I said, we did see the a bush baby the other night, which was awesome. Well, actually, not the other night, last night. <laughs> but it was a brief visual of that bush baby. So... What a peaceful evening. Absolutely peaceful. No, nope, I don't see anything yet. I don't see too much this side. Well, we're going to sit at uh, Treehouse Dam. I'm just going to listen out a little bit here. Um, see if we can pick up on any uh, calls or alarm calls and that. Uh, while we're at Treehouse Dam. Let's head back uh, to Rex and, and see how's it going on his line tracking. Come back uh, from Cedric. We are uh, got a Pacific boundary. We are going to check at uh, Pacific Dam, trying to figure out exactly here where might be the rest of the pride of crossed to the north. I'm still maybe just because of uh, still dark, but uh, let's take an opportunity. By the report, look at the lions, the big pride of the cubs. If it happens that they might left the cubs behind north of the dam, and headed uh, maybe to the north. Or now I would like to follow up here. I still have a little bit of doubt that the rest of the party can take the cubs over to the north. Maybe if they can hear something that uh, they really likes to go after, maybe they can cross over. But uh, by the report, they were not far from here, straight to the dam. If any cross of pointing, it will be right here where we are. Let's see. Maybe we might be lucky. The only thing, the area where they are, there is no network coverage towards the dam. But uh, let us try. Maybe we might be lucky to find something there. to hear from our Wild Earth Kids this World Environment Day. You are the future protectors of our planet and we want to help you understand what needs to be preserved. We saw a termite mound. We got to see a lot of unique animals. Some trees are male and female. That's pretty cool, right? A whole lot of different creatures. It was amazing that we could ask questions. Kids, send in your questions for our special World Environment Day safari on June the 5th. It was so cool! As our global Wild Earth family grows, we know that many of you struggle to get your questions answered during the live safari. Going forward, we will be holding AMAs for our Wild Earth explorers on a regular basis. The first is with our resident leopard whisperer, Tristan Dix. Join me for an AMA on the 8th of June, straight after the Sunset Safari. This will be your chance to ask me anything you like. All you have to do is sign up to be an explorer, and you can meet me here on Juma with your questions ready. We are approaching the dam, get uh, no information. Just cross the finger to see something here. Let's take this opportunity back to Cedric. Yes, I'm also crossing fingers for Rex, and I believe he does find something, especially if there's buffalo tracks. Maybe those lions are following those buffaloes. But we are still sitting at a Treehouse Dam, and I just want to quickly give an update on those uh, widow birds. Yeah, just to read it. We do get that white winged widow bird there. Pretty much the only widow bird that we do get in this area. Um, there is another two, the red shouldered widow bird and the red collared widow bird, but they more towards uh, the southwestern tip of uh, the Kruger National Park when I'm talking about this area or to the southwestern tip of the Kruger National Park but yes we definitely get the white winged widow bird around here. Yeah. So yes there's an update on that widow bird. So that 
once again, really thank you for all that because it made me definitely look that up quickly before I doubted myself in many ways. And uh, it's always, always a good thing to look up things. All right, well, we're going to continue. I think there's not much happening at Treehouse Dam. We have some data. I have been listening out for anything around here. And I have heard nothing. So, yeah. So, we are going to move forward. I did not even hear a bleep or a bloop or anything. <laughs> White Mane, good afternoon. Um, Timber, White Mane. You know the last update I got on Samba was I left. I, I want to actually go backtrack that one. I remember it was the same day that Kelly broke down with um, Wendy, and then I continued the drive and I found him uh, just east of uh, Molawati, just east of the Molawati, uh, or actually east of Trondams in the Molawati. And um, that was the last time I heard about, heard from him, seen him, heard from him, and uh, there was nothing else that uh, came about from that day. So uh, maybe somebody else has got some other light to shine here for me because uh, I definitely uh, don't have any more information on that. But it would be nice to find out what happened to Simba. Definitely, it would be because he is such a stunning male. I mean, as you know, he is still uh, a good genes from Kashaba. And from, if I'm not playing, is it Mvula or is it Tingana? Oh, no, I must watch out for that one. But one of the two. But Kachaba anyway. Good genes. So, well, e e even e e either of Mvula or Tingana, they still look good. Beautiful leopards as well. So, hopefully Mvula. <laughs> I like Mvula. <laughs> no. But yeah. But anyway, it's him. Um, Oh, hopefully we see Temba again. Hopefully we see him coming up the side. But maybe he went south. Maybe he went into Mola Mola. That was his general direction. So heading to that, uh, that area. Oh, there's a lot of elephants that came through here. My word. Loads and loads of elephantes that uh, pushed. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word! Sorry, sorry. That I didn't even. Okay, let me just put off lights. <laughs> oh, yo, that was a surprise. I did not see them at all. As I was talking about elephants, they surprised me with that trumpet. And like, you know, when your heart kind of falls down in your tummy, that's exactly what happened there. I'm like, oh, couldn't breathe. That was, uh, uh, it was a funny trumpet as well. It wasn't just a normal trumpet. That was like a, that was like a trumpet that was uh, faulty or something. Like a faulty trumpet. <laughs> it's, it's almost like the first time you play a trumpet and you don't know how... <laughs> it's like almost when you start playing a trumpet for the first time and you don't know how to blow in it, so you actually always like... <laughs> <laughs> oh my word, that was funny. <laughs> To celebrate World Oceans Day and create awareness for the role that the oceans play in everyday life, Wild Earth has some brand new Dive Live merchandise in our shop. T-shirts, sweatshirts, bags and even caps. So take the plunge, head over to our shop and see what you can find. Wild Earth, it's in your nature. We only have one Earth. This phrase highlights the challenges of collective action between nations. It emphasizes the great test of our time. 
Achieving environmental change cannot be met by countries acting alone. Head over to the Wild Earth Shop to buy your only One Earth merchandise and create awareness for global change this World Environment Day. Alright, I'm going to do... I'm going to do my last drive by on um, on Zoe's. I'm hoping for tortoise pan tonight. I have to do it. It's got to it's got to be my lucky night. Please, tortoise pan, please come through for me tonight. You can do it. Or even Shadulu. Even Shadulu. I would love Shadulu as well. She's so beautiful. Beautiful female, beautiful male leopard. That yo. All right. While well, we continue up uh, Gary Main towards Zoe's, let's head back to Rexon and see how his search and tracking is going. Welcome back uh, from Cedric Crossfinger. Cedric uh, working around Zoe's, maybe extended a little bit to the north there. That is the last position of uh, uh, tracks of look like Tamangume. You might be lucky on that surrounding. We are just north of uh, Befesuk Dam. We see where the line have crossed from the north. Would like to check uh, follow up towards the uh, Hyena Road where I've seen tracks look like um, the buffalo have crossed from the north to the uh, south. Maybe we might be lucky with something. Who knows? Lions like to hunt buffalo this time of the year quite a lot. If they can get a scent of the buffalo, if they've crossed to uh, direct to the uh, north, they might charge them behind. It's in the nature of a lion at night. They really risk a lot to hunt even healthy buffalo. You tend to see them going for them. And I know that Kuhumas uh, are the best. I mean, I put money when it comes to lion hunting in the area. Kuhumas is the uh, pride of lions. If I see them that uh, they're going to hunt and there's a buffalo around, I can spend a night with them. I guarantee it will be something that I'm going to witness. Again, guys, moving here, you'll never know. The only thing, the direction of the lions and leopard is not permanent. It's not like us. If you go to town, you go to town. Still, as you find, you might find that uh, in a bigger picture of the head, if they're still walking in an area where they, it's a preference, to be in the open, they will be still active, but if they reach the destination of a day where they feel more comfortable on that particular area, more special an area where there's no bush, they like to lie down on those areas. But if they haven't reached that area, they might be still walking in purpose to get into the area where it's safe for the whole head. But in most of cases, honest speaking, they might be settled down by now. It happens that uh, Sometimes we find that they get disturbed and they never reach the area in time and they'll be still a little bit active now. Remember, three days back, we, we just come across with the buffalo uh, there by uh, three houses, if I remember. I was with uh, Hart and the buffalo were moving towards uh, Flemont's Catlan and look like they overnight from Flemont's Catlan because it's a it lot more open. It can accommodate the whole herd of the buffalo in order to settle down because they need to see the enemy coming from the distance if it's very close thick like this it's very difficult to see a lion they tend to be surprised and maybe one or two get killed and also if they force moving into the woodland like this is where you find that lions are very clever they force them and one or two may lose uh, their feet from logs and stay behind and make hunt easy for them. I'm turning here. This is a Heiner Road. 
This is one of the road that have lots of more uh, natural pen along the side of the road. And believe me, the buffalo lives that caught a lot of elephant and uh, other species, of course, that are water dependent species. They really love the area like this. Are you a fan of the Juma clan? If the answer to this is yes, then you are cordially invited to our Hyena Halabaloo starting on the 13th of June. During this week, we want to take a trip down memory lane. Please send in your favorite Juma clan moments to hahina at wildearth.tv by the 7th of June and we will dig into our archives and try our hardest to play it out during this week of Hyena celebrations. way into into the kill to eat get their fill in there as well but they're also going to be told off see it's lions are not great at sharing their food. okay cows let me just take in frustration out on the other lion but you see it was interesting It's very practical and common, uh, lions moving area like this, or also hunting in an area like this. Uh, let's take this opportunity um, over to Cedric. Yeah, so I'm just ambling up uh, uh, Zoe's at this point in time. I'm actually just trying to see if I can see any of those uh, tracks for all those male leopards that's been eluding me for the last uh, several weeks um, on Zoe's. So I am going up here again and I'm just giving it another go for the last time here. So I'm hoping that I do bump into something or do see something. Yeah. But on top of that, we're also looking for little ones. Maybe find a chameleon. Uh, I am looking for the little chameleons. We did find one the other night, but it was quite tucked in these bushes and hidden away from all eyes. So yeah, but it is going to be quite tough at this time of the year. Uh, as well as in, uh, any little nocturnal things that will jump out at us. Oh, you see, that's a thing. I'm just, I'm so scared that I do see layer tracks here now and I'm going to start crying it's going south because then it goes towards Hoffman's. And I don't want that to happen. Clearly, I don't want that to happen. But yes, I'm hoping that those buffaloes coming over with uh, Rex and would be fantastic to see if they do start bringing those, uh, those three female lionesses that went over uh, during the day into Buffalzook. I wonder if they didn't turn around and try to follow those buffaloes. So I'm hoping and holding thumbs that Rexon does find uh, some lions around there. I find it's that like usually at this time of the night when you find buffaloes and you really look behind the buffaloes and around the buffaloes on the on the edges or out there on the outskirts and sometimes you see a pride of lions following them which is always uh, a nice thing. But uh, you're I remember many years ago as well following um, a herd of buffalo and uh, we found uh, Kinky Tail and Mr. T. This was in 2010, beginning of 2010. And uh, we found Kinky Tail and Mr. T, uh, Mr. T, two big male lions following this herd of buffalo. This was on Nkoro and um, we are in the north. And while we were following the buffalo, of course, Kinky Tail and Mr. T came in and started chasing these buffalo. So they were just ahead of us. And while they were chasing the buffalo and that, of course, you must imagine all, it was about maybe two, 300 buffalo. All those flies that were sitting on the buffalo, like, of course, took off because now the buffalo are running away from these lions. And every fly took off. It, like, it was like a wave. It looked like, like this dark, plague coming towards us of flies and uh, Peter and myself another guide that were following and chasing after the lions and the buffalo uh, we were just covered covered in flies all over but our guests at the back were eating so many flies that I think we didn't even have to serve them dinner that night it was uh, there were so many unfortunately they were unsuccessful with the kill um, but it was just uh, one of those moments where 
Uh, he would rather think, okay, Lions continue chasing. I'm going to be pulling out of the sighting because it was just uh, unbearable with all those flies. But it does happen. But that's what makes it quite exciting and entertaining at once. And uh, of course, uh, definitely got uh, a few flies in the mouth, which is not too bad. It's not too bad. We all survived. All survived. This morning we were driving and suddenly we heard a lot of commotion. I think the wild dogs might have caught an impala then, or the leopard might have caught the impala and as it was dragging it, the wild dog saw it, started chasing the leopard up into the tree and then the hyenas came to steal it. But, uh, what an incredible sighting. The Safari Guide of the Year 2022 is approaching us rapidly. This year, we'll be heading to Bushwise Field Guides at the Southern African Wildlife College from the 27th June till the 2nd of July. We will soon meet all our contestants who are vying for the prize of being the very best of the best. And the judges who will put them through their paces. Join me, Steve Falkenbridge, as we dream it, guide it, win it. Ellie girl, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are watching from. Now, we do not see dasis around here, we don't have those uh, mountains or like here in the Sabi Sands uh, per se, but uh, we don't have any of that uh, uh, that, that kind of habitat for, uh, for rock dasis. I think maybe they're in the Drakensberg, all along the Drakensberg mountain ranges, all the way down to, of course, Penguin Beach to uh, Betty's Bay. I think uh, Jackson Byron, they've got their little friends that hang around there uh, with the penguins. So I don't know what the, the one does his name is now. Oh, oh, what's it? <laughs> Jared, do you know what the one does his name is? Like the one in Penguin Beach? I can't, I can't remember that one. <laughs> As well, <laughs> but he, he is a dusty. Apparently, you know, he looks uh, he looks upset all the time. That dusty. So I think I don't know if it's uh, actually. I would give that. Uh, I would give a dusty a name called Quatile. You know, Quatile means angry, because the dusty always looks angry. They've got those angry eyes. Actually, Jax uh, pointed it at me, and uh, they always got these angry eyes and angry faces. So yeah, Quatile. Oh, that's actually quite a nice time. I remember Quatile, we had a Quatile, yeah, but it was a leopard, a female leopard. She wasn't really Quatile, I don't know why they call her Quatile, but she was chilled. I think uh, Tandy was brackets Quatile. But yeah, we don't get those uh, rock dussies around here, the Horaxes. I said one or two in my life, and then when I went to Penguin Beach, it was one of the times I've actually really got to look at one properly and see how they actually look like. But sure, oh, if there was if there was uh, dasis around here, yeah, I'm sure the birds of prey would be loving life. They look very plumpish. Anyway, let's uh, head to Rex and see how his, uh, his safari is going. Welcome back uh, from Sad, Sad uh, around uh, Zoe's. You just reminded me, Frederick, uh, the female elephant called Quatile, um, 15 years, 20 years back uh, in the Conservancy of Juma, it gave me a hard time that uh, female. I remember one day I was uh, with the gas, uh, with the land, a land cruiser full of gas, about 12 of them, and I was like relaxed, not knowing that Quatile is in the area. It's one of the very aggressive uh, female elephant that used to be in the surrounding, and they come flying from the bush, charging, and I have to put foot. And it happens that I was so relaxed and gave me fright. 
when you talk about the name Kwatile, it just remind me my experience of Kwatile female. And uh, later on, about five minutes back, it really sent my memory of all what happens to me here in Juma. I was driving the Haina Road where we didn't have a little bit of coverage. The first time when the Avoca male uh, arrived here in this central part of the property from the north, they come across with Hummus just after Birmingham left in the area. They sub that they uh, hunted the buffalo very close to where I was stopping and uh, really uh, lecturing about the lion, what can do. And there were uh, all the entire family of Kuhumis and the two of the uh, avocas, Mohawk and Blondie, and interacted with the female. And there were female everywhere running away because if the new male arrives in a pride, mainly the sub adults are going to be killed. But lucky enough with these uh, uh, Voka males, they never kill any of the humans. They settle in there and they were everywhere and we see females look like flying all over. And we uh, really realized that the two, three males are back in the area and they were vocalizing and were chasing the female try to settle with the female of course is how actually lions do they have to show their muscles of course and their ability whether they're strong or not and later on they have settled with kuhumas and peacefully moving with them from that day kuhumas soon they settled down they extended the area to the west around If you would like to be a part of the team that shares the wildebeest migration in Kenya live on Wild Earth, then we have some great news for you. There are a few places left to join our expeditions in August and September this year. You'll be staying in an exclusive tented camp with ensuite bedrooms nestled in the riverine woodlands of the Talek River. Head over to our website to book your bucket list experience today. Wild Earth Expeditions. Travel with purpose. In that tree are two carcasses. There's a diker carcass and a water buck. Oh, it's not as graceful as me. <laughs> He's a bit hesitant because, well, climbing a tree is not the easiest, but he will get up there eventually. So let's see, there he goes. And look at the power in that. That is a massive 500 pound cat that has just climbed a marula tree and is up in there. How cool is this? I don't know how he's gonna do it, but let's see. First time ever we, we, we located the Mapajo, Mapajo males. They were all six junior boys. And they were a lot more intimidating, scary looking pride uh, on the buffalo kill. And uh, by that time, we used to have 26 individual members of Kuhumas in the pride. They came in, started to kill the buffalo. After two, three days, they headed to Central, straight east tortured back in Kruger National Park and we were like now travel have come into the area and we didn't uh, believe that they will come back because the two males that with the Kuhuma by that time they were strong big enough the second time when they come back uh, they caused a lot of chaos around in the area they have killed many uh, individual uh, lion lions in the pride of uh, Kuhumas I believe in a day They've killed more than six to eight individual females. You know that when the pride are big enough like that in collation, especially in the very same age, they tend to really uh, become more aggressive and abuse the power of the collation being together as a young males. It was very sad to see that I remember one day after game drive, I was very close to Michelle's house and still, I mean, standing there in the front, inside um, in the yard. They go, <coughs> the Mapojos were chasing Kuhumas and killing all the sub adults. And uh, it was really scary uh, seeing that we were all like crying and look at the pride because they're demolishing the whole pride and we didn't know what's going to happen. But of course, 
in the uh, lion kingdom that is in nature but for us because uh, you know these are lions and leopard it becomes uh, part of our life best characters that we really love to see in a daily basis most especially as i was saying i mean uh, be with the kuhumas you know that uh, there will be always action and that all of that uh, interaction with the pride it gives you guarantee that if you follow this pride and you fall in love in that particular pride anything that will happen as a naturalist you will tend to be not happy for instance let me take an example with kalamba cups if anything that goes kill kalamba cups it will upset the whole uh, area all the naturalists around in the area they won't be happy if it's a certain hyena that they know by name you tend to be not to be accepted into the whole area. It's how it works out here in nature. People, they fall in love with animals and tend to be part of their life, more especially. Some of them have motions. Of course, if they do uh, lose a cat, like uh, Talamba, for instance, or lion, they know the mouse or dark mane. See, the hyenas are far more tolerant of vultures than a lion or leopard would be. Occasionally a hyena will bite sort of a couple of tail feathers out of the back of a vulture, but I've never actually seen them, even once they've caught one, um, actually kill it. Oh, there we go, nearly got him. Hyena and hippo walking side by side. Terror etched on the expression of little hippo. Look at this last mad dash. Hyena running along beside it. Baby hippo jaws gaping. It's gonna make it. It's gonna make it. It did it. The baby hippo against all odds into the area they challenge the power of mapojos around in the area and it's where they're limited to uh, go around and kill other leopard and being the two pride in the same equal individual numbers they tend to challenge one another and test the strength and the dominance around the area both pride they have these loose individuals into the uh, society is where the mapojos decided to uh, to give those young juniors space to live a little bit more to the south and Machingis uh, conquered down in the area for a while and after a while of course they follow Machinga and they follow Mapojos to the south because these are uh, two uh, big collection of uh, male lion ever in the history of Savisans. It has really given one another big trouble and also left a lot more information and experience. Let us take this opportunity and back to Cedric looking for total spread. Yes, definitely that conflict between Majingis and Mapokos was insane at that time. And, uh, and, and Kumas did lose a lot of cubs due to the Mapokos. And uh, it was quite a, quite a takeover in, uh, those, uh, in those years. And it does usually happen with those coalitions. But uh, well, there's definitely no success on my side here with any tracks for tortoise pan or any male leopard coming down on Zoe's. So it looks like this has definitely uh, in a bit of a quiet road. I don't see too much. I've been looking as well for any little chameleons that's uh, hanging around. Maybe they can give me a last little view on them. Because I don't think we're going to see much more of them now from now on. So they can look. But yes. Majingis, Mapokos, it was the funniest time of my career <coughs> and uh, definitely I uh, went, uh, I think they took over on the 10th of uh, June or 10th of July, 10th of June or 10th of July, the Majingis took over Mapokos and at that time I was on leave, there was a soccer world cup that's still on and I was on leave for my two weeks and uh, that happened and my colleague Peter decided to send me a message saying, guess what we just saw? 
and uh, yeah, yeah, Majing is killing the Mapokos uh, all the one. So that was quite quite hectic, quite hectic. But that is how male coalitions are. They do take over in those uh, ways. So I'm sure it's not just the Mapokos that's done that and Majingis, but I'm sure a lot of other coalitions have uh, kind of uh, done the same scenario. That's why I think with the male lines, it's always a vicious this circle. Just listen. I thought I heard lines now as we're talking. Might be just, I think, just Rusty. When was Rusty's, uh, <laughs> Rusty's um, breaks there? But uh, yes, but anyway, thank you very much for everybody for joining us on uh, 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 World Dead, uh, Environment Day today. It was absolutely a wonderful day to uh, talk about symbiotic relationships between species and uh, all things great and beautiful in this area. And uh, thank you so much for questions and thank you for your comments. It has really, really meant a lot for us today. And um, hopefully we can see you tomorrow morning on our sunrise safari. I won't be joining it. I'm going to be going on leave for a few weeks. So I will see everybody in a few weeks. But of course, from the entire Wild Earth team, from all of us, from our directors, our guides and camops, we just want to say thank you very much and have a wonderful evening tonight. Viewer discretion is advised.